Yeah, thank you, Father. Let's just pray. Father, we just, would you do this? Would you make contact with him? Would you open your heart to him? Would you ask him to speak to you, your heart, your life right now, where you're at? Like, speak to you to where you would think when you leave here. Man, God, if I was the only one in the room, I mean, if there was a thousand people in the room, I mean, you were talking to me. Would you ask him to speak to you like that tonight? Would you tell him you want to hear and understand? Would you talk to him right now like that? Father, we just thank you. Yeah. We're not looking just for a good service, a good sermon. We're not looking for an accolade of, wow, that was good. Touch and transform our lives. Empower us. Give us understanding. And do what you paid for tonight in our lives through the blood and name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. 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 Good. So i got a couple new faces. Who's totally new tonight? You weren't here before. I know. I saw you just... Okay. Hi, I'm sorry, Uncle. Uncle. And Uncle, Uncle John. 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 Good to see you, Uncle John. I haven't seen you yet. Okay, Jody. And my guitar man. You ever sitting beside you? I don't think I've seen you talk before. So the reason I'm saying that is just because I want to... We had two sessions. I want to... I wanna, Talk about what we talked about back there tonight, about how we get to where what we heard. How, how do we become what we heard in the last two sessions? Who, who would think that would be helpful? Like, so, so what I want to do is bring it to speed, the, the, the handful of new faces, just so you're on page with us. We, we talked about why God sent His Son. It's fascinating. There's churches all over, and there's going to be thousands and thousands of churches in session tomorrow. But if you would ask the average attending Christian, average Christian church attender, why God sent His Son, probably the, really the only answer you would get across the board most, most times when you ask that question is to forgive us of our sins so we can go to heaven when we die. Yeah. And that's what we've preached strong in this country. Mm. And a lot of people don't understand why God really sent His Son. They don't understand that God made man with intention. God made man with a purpose. That yes. purpose got lost through sin, yes. and man got separated from God, and in getting separated from God, he got separated from purpose. Yes. So instead of man living by the Spirit and walking in love, now he's living by the flesh in need of love. So it's a total perversion and a 180 degree twist. So see, Adam didn't just sin in the garden. You have to understand he took on the nature of God's enemy. And he became totally self-centered, self-focused, self-defending, self-protecting, and self-driven. Mm. And everybody since then was born into that lie. Yeah. Into Adam. Every man for himself. Every man was born into self-centeredness. And you must be born. And unfortunately, we turn born again into a prayer we pray at an order that takes us to heaven when we die. Instead of a new life that we live. And a purpose that we walk in. Are you with me? Yes. yes. So for the new people, this is we talked about this strong. And we talked about God making man with intention. And God made man in his image. And the image of God is love. God made man to love, not need love. Well, every one of us has been so needy. Okay. Because we haven't been grafted back in like we understand, like we should be. Like we, we, we think we are in a, in, a, in a theological sense, but we don't understand what this means. Like the love that I need is from Him. I need to be grafted back in and become one with Him so that I can step back into purpose and begin to manifest who He is this way through my life. Yeah. We've turned it into God just doing something else for me, doing something more for me, doing something today for me. Instead of... God doing something for us, why don't we think about becoming something because of Him? Amen. Amen. Are you following? Yes. So this is stuff we talked about strong in the last two sessions. We talked about what love looks like. There's no way I can recap the last two sessions, or I'd have to do two sessions, but like because they were long and they were they were full of a lot. I, I get accused of, and I don't think it's just an accusation, of saying a lot in a short time when I'm rolling. So people are like, note takers say like, whoa, I was like trying to take notes, and I think I missed three things in between those two notes. Now you know why we have you Yes. <laughs> so, 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 so we were born into Adam. We were born into, everybody in this room was needy. Everybody, when you were born, you didn't have an identity. You were finding yourself along the way. This is a tragic thing. Like, nobody really knows, has any idea of who they are. So they think they're trying to find themselves along the way. That's why people's story and past is so, 
important to them. That's why they talk so much about how it's been and growing up because they were the moments that begin to fashion their personality and who they were and their identity, but it's none of it tinged on truth. So people say, well, you don't know what I am this way. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what my childhood was like. You don't know what it's like living in my house. And, and all of a sudden, their story becomes their identity. Come on. But in Christianity, old things pass away and all things become new. You die to everything you've ever been and everything that's ever been done to you. It's on purpose. If you come to Christ, you have to deny your yeah. Why? Because it's the biggest problem on the planet is men living for themselves when they're made for God's image. Yes. yes. So when you're made for God's image, God is love, and you're living for yourself. Love is void of self. Self is void of love. There's not an ounce of love in self-centeredness. And there's not an ounce of self-centeredness in love. You can find it in Scripture. So we talked about this for two sessions. We talked about what love looks like and in situations and, and not becoming a product of what you're going through, but actually understanding that you're called to manifest Christ in the middle of whatever you're going through. That's right. We talked about the fact that we're the lights in the world. Jesus said that. That's not high-minded. Jesus said, you, you, you are the light of the world. Amen. Yes. Well, light's supposed to shine. Amen. Amen. He said, you are the light. Nobody lights a lamp and puts a bushel over it. The light's supposed to be on the lamp stand for all to see and give light to the room, right? Yes. So he says, you're the light of the world. Your city set on a hill cannot be hidden. You're the light of the world, so let your light so shine. Before men, so they see your life lived and glorify the Father. What's that mean? That the light points to the Father. Yes. The life you're living is the revelation of Him. Yes. Follow this. If Jesus said, when you see me, you've already seen the Father, that I only do the will of him who sent me, I only say what I hear him say, I only do what I see him do, that when you see me, Philip, how can you ask me, show us the Father? Have you not been with me so long that you don't even know that when you see me, you've already seen him? When the same Jesus says, hey, follow me, the things I do, you do. Yes. Yeah? What's Jesus saying? I'm revealing the Father, and at the same time, I'm revealing the life you were created to live because you were made for His image, and your life should reveal the Father. Yes. yes. We've turned in, we turn Christianity into something God serves us in. Come on. Protects us, provides for us, blesses us. And most people are on a self-centered journey to get more out of God. Come on. <laughs> and then life is speaking way louder than truth, and now they're doing no better than how their circumstances are unfolding. Yeah. And how they're doing is based on how it's going instead of who he is in them and why. Yes. So I preach all the time, man, when you get squeezed, Jesus ought to come out. Come on. And a bunch of other stuff. Come on, it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. This isn't yes. just theology. This is spirit living. Yes. That's why he gave us his spirit. Yes. So we can look like him in the moment. So the Bible says... To walk in love just as He loved. That's in Ephesians 5. It's verse 1. We're to be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love just like He loved. It didn't say somewhat like He loved. That's incredible that the Bible calls me to walk in love like He loves. That's telling me that I can love the God love. I can love like God loves. Why? Because grace is going to empower me if I'm willing. And this is where I'm going to take you tonight. In the light of just that little recap for the new faces... This is where we've been for two sessions. Yeah. Now we share a lot of practical examples, marriage, what marriage can look like, things we've done, and the way we've learned to talk in the language of the earth versus the language of heaven that God didn't teach us to speak any of the stuff we grew up saying. Yeah. Right? Amen. There's a way that seems right, and that's the problem, ain't it? Because it seems right. But it's not producing life, so it doesn't matter how right it seems. If it ain't producing life and shining light, then let's throw it out. Amen. Amen. There's a way that seemeth right to a man, but its way leads there unto, unto death and destruction is death. So we need to get the wisdom of God. Corinthians says that Christ Jesus has become the wisdom of God for us. Let me just let me just let me rip this off quickly, then we're going to go into because I want to show you how I want to give you some practical examples and show you how we walk out what I'm saying. So you don't leave here and bite your lip and say, okay, I'm supposed to love like God. <laughs> no, you're not supposed to love like God. You become the love of God. Yes. Yes. This isn't something you do. This is something you be. Mm. Christianity is always living out of your being, not your doing. It's living out of your being. 
Watch this. If you wake up in the morning and you believe you're accepted in the beloved, you will never live like you're unaccepted. You will never again be insecure. If you actually believe God loves you, forgives you, and you're clean in His sight, it will actually empower you to begin to live clean like you never thought was possible. Yes. Amen. The Bible says righteousness produces its fruit to holiness. Amen. If I wake up and try to live righteous, I'm going to be sin conscious, failure conscious, self conscious, take a test in my mind at the end of the day, and my grade is my end. <laughs> But if I wake up and actually believe it's finished and He loves me, and I got nothing to prove just to be, like to be His, to be forgiven, yes. to be accepted, to be His Son. And I wake up in the morning, what would a Christian look like in the morning if they open their eyes instead of saying, ugh, and thinking of their plate and their day and their schedule before noon, and God, I got it every day, and I'll have a plate, if you don't intervene, I ain't going to make it till noon. God, I need you. And they call that prayer. <laughs> What would it look like if you woke up in the morning and said, Good morning. And yes. I'm so honored to have another day with you. Yes. Thank you that mercy woke me up to give me one more day to be like you. Yes. God, I so thank you for loving me, washing me, forgiving me. It's so good to be clean in your sight, in your presence. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, that would crush insecurity. That would crush the flesh. That would crush self. Yes. What would happen if a Christian just wake up, body don't even feel like getting out of bed? You feel like you could use another extra hour to sleep, but you know you've got a commitment at work, and instead of just being a body of flesh, right? You're heading to the bathroom, Lord, I don't care, I can sleep another hour, but you know what? You're good to me. I want to shine today. What an honor that I can go to my job. What a mission field. And all of a sudden, you're turning your heart and God. By the time you hit the bathroom and look in the mirror, you ain't saying hug. You're going, hey, good morning. You know, I talk to myself in the mirror, not so much anymore, but I've done it a lot. <laughs> Now and then, I'll drive and I'm in traffic. You know how you're checking your mirrors and you're switching lanes? And every once in a while, I'll catch my eyes in the mirror and go, Oh, I see you. <laughs> and it's just fun, man. And the Spirit of God touches me in that moment. Like, He comes in my little Toyota truck. I'm like, oh, I see you in there. <laughs> I've walked by my full length mirror to leave the house. I've done it a lot. I don't do it much anymore. I just believe it. But I've done it a lot. I walk by full length mirror and I go, are you kidding me? <laughs> oh my goodness, man. I can see you know him. You believe he loves you. He lives inside of you. Look at that. I see him in your countenance. Yes. I yes. see him in your eyes, man. And I look at myself right now. I see, I can talk like that because I ain't seeing my past. I ain't seeing my alcoholic dad. I ain't seeing my sick mother that died. I ain't seeing none of that. Because none of that's my story. Yes. Amen. My story is Christ crucified. Yes. yes. <laughs> And then I see him. Because now he got room to come in because none of that other stuff is occupying me. None of that about my past is who I am. I don't have a past. I have a present and things to come. Yes. My past has been swallowed up and bought. With yes. the yes. Yes. See, when you look at me, you can't tell my daddy to this day never said I love you. You can't tell my mama was sick for 40 years of my 48 years of life. Now I'm 62, but she died when I was 48. You can't tell that. You can't tell I changed her diapers when I was young. You can't tell that. You can't tell my wife was in identity crisis for eight years and my kids ran wild. You can't tell that when you look at me. Why? Because none of that has anything to do with who I am. Exactly. And you ain't never going to tell that. Because it's not who I am. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you get it? Yes. So I don't need prayer and ministry and inner healing. <laughs> sarcastic, it was a little bit. <laughs> I need truth that makes me free, the new identity. I need yes. to put on the yes. garments of righteousness, holiness, and stand before God as He says I am in His sight. I'm not a neglected child living in a 62-year-old body. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> some weird stuff. <laughs> People believe it. Yeah. They're telling me there's a spirit of rejection on them because when their mom heard they were pregnant, they said, oh, I don't want this baby. And now they think they're 42 and they're still living under the bondage of rejection because of what one woman said is that the power of the blood isn't enough to break some words of frustration in a moment when a lady was overwhelmed. <laughs> I hope you think that stuff is silly and never happens <coughs> Because it only has the power you give it. 
You're telling me that my mother could have said she didn't want me and that's going to damn the rest of my life and I can't get to God who is God? You think he ain't bigger than the sins of a parent? <laughs> Come on. We just give way too much power to the past. And when we do that, we never step into our present and future. So guess what happens? Tomorrow's always yesterday. Yep. Right. Ten years from now is still yesterday. Yep. Twenty years of church attendance and it's still about how it was when you were growing up. Mm. And when does that ever change? The day you believe the gospel. Yes. 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 Are you with me? Yes. yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I'll yes. calm down. I'll calm down. <laughs> First John 1 says you're to walk in the light. You the girl. Walk in the light. As he's in the light. Not close to, not somewhat like. As he's in the light. What's that telling her? That if she's willing, grace is able. Yes. He's not calling her to something he's empowering her to do. Amen. He ain't calling her to something that's impossible. Amen. Except in her own strength, it's impossible. Something you have to understand, the Christian life is impossible. Matthew 5, the Beatitudes, the attitudes of being, Matthew 5, 6, 7, impossible. You can't live it in your own strength. Just you never muster up enough discipline to go do it. You have to be it. Yes. And it's by the grace of God. You're saved by what? Grace. Okay, so when this young lady says, okay, and she's weeping before the Lord, and you ain't in her room, she's in her room. It's just her her, her soul before God. And she's weeping, and she's, she's reading that, and she says, come oh, I'm so worried that I can walk in the light and shine. You live in me. You love me. And you want to reveal yourself through me. God, I thank you for the grace to shine in every situation, every moment. God, I'm so glad to be yours. I love you. Who can see her doing that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 What's that going to do to her? As she's releasing faith from a sincere heart, faith from her love, grace is coming. To make her faith her reality and transform her into what she desires because she's not self-made. She is what she is by the grace of God. Yes. Grace is God's power, God's yes. working ability on your yes. behalf. Grace is in mercy. Grace is in power. Yes. 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 Are you with me? Yes. yes. So all of a sudden, she's being saved by grace through faith. And all of a sudden, her life is being transformed because what she's believing is the truth is becoming her reality. Yes. And all of a sudden, she gets thrown in a situation and begins to respond like she never responded before. But it ain't because she's trying or thinking about it. It's because she's changing and she sees different and she's been with him. Amen. Yes. Amen. So now she ain't trying to do this. She is this. Yes. That's why it ain't about failing, it's about becoming. Yes. But if you try to step out and do this, you're going to weigh off your failing. And then if you think, oh, I was just frustrated, I'm not getting this. And you're going to weigh yourself by yourself. And you're going to think because you had a bad thought, your mind's messed up. <laughs> yeah? Yes. First John 5, or First John 1, it says we walk in the light. As he's in the light. We fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us of what? All oh. our sin. Our all unrighteousness. And if, we're, if, we, if we come and we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to what? Forgive. Forgives us of how many sins? All. Oh. So in two verses, he cleansed you of all unrighteousness and forgave you of all sin. <laughs> So when is it just okay for the Christian to believe they're righteous? Today. All the time. All the time. So if he cleansed you of all unrighteousness, what's left? Righteousness. righteousness. It's so simple. <laughs> like Aldro. And if he forgave you of all your sin, does he see sin when he sees you? No. Then we shouldn't see sin. That's correct. Romans 6 actually tells you and I, and the church fights this tooth and nail, I found that the greater majority of the church does not believe Scripture. Yep. Yeah. It believes our human experience. Yes. Yep. 
The greatest part of the church is trying to rationalize scripture through our own experiences. It says stuff like, yeah, but brother, we're always going to sin. We're never perfect. You know, we always have sin. And even if we don't realize it, there's still sin because we're not as pure as God. And we're not sensitive to what sin really is. So we always have sin. And it's like, what are you trying to accomplish by saying that? It sounds so humble, but it's unbelief and false humility. The Bible doesn't tell you to talk like that. Nope. Not even close, anywhere. It says, reckon yourself dead indeed to sin. And here we are, leaders and teachers, saying, well, now just stay humble because you'll never be perfect. We're always going to sin. And, and I'm like, oh my goodness. So if the preacher's preaching that, that means he fits that. Ah. And because he fits that, he can't preach anything else. Oh, wow. <laughs> Ooh. That's a sobering thought. Wow. Yeah. Romans 6 says that you died in the likeness of his death, and the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives unto God. It's verse 10. You can check and make sure I'm telling the truth. And verse 11 says, You likewise reckon yourself dead and dead unto sin, yeah. but alive. In Christ Jesus. So if she's waking up every morning alive in Christ Jesus. Yes. Father, I thank you you made me alive. I thank you you love me. I thank you you've delivered me from yesterday and every day before. You've given me a present. You've given me things to come. The world in front of me is a mission field. And you've lit a light in me. Thanks for loving me. Yes. That's what I call prayer. Amen. Yes. My God, please make the car run and I hope I don't hit too many red lights. And God, you know it's going to be a tough day at work. I need your grace to get through because I'm working beside Billy. Are you serious? Billy, <laughs> Billy, come on. And then we call that prayer. Yeah. And then instead of a self centered whirlwind, come on. Yeah. that means you're going to be dictated by your day and your circumstances. Guaranteed, because if Billy has a moment, you're wondering why God makes you work beside him, and you're wondering why God doesn't change him, and you're wondering what you did so bad to deserve to have to work by him, and all of a sudden, one guy that's a little hungry called Billy is dictating your whole identity in life, wow. and you're spiritualizing through it as if the whole thing is God. Yep. <laughs> that's messy. Yeah. And making something matter that don't even matter at all. And if I can call it like it is, it's a total self-centered whirlwind. Yes. It's just all about you and what you got to go through and what you got to face. And now it's like you got this personal sidekick called God that's here to get you through your day. No, he's here to reveal who he is through you in the midst of your day. Yes. And especially to Billy. Mm -hmm. uh, we're praying for Billy to change. If we were really here in the spirit, he's saying, how about becoming more like me? Yep. Yep. So you see Billy the way I do. That's right. So you never react to Billy. You know how many Christians ask for a new job because they're frustrated with the one they're working at? <laughs> and I will never pray for you for a new job. I ask God to fall and chain you to your old job. Until <laughs> 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 you get a revelation. <laughs> Because if you leave your job for that reason, will it show up at your next job? Yeah. It's like a person addicted to drugs. They try to move and change locations and find a, a neutral city. You'll find a move right beside a guy dealing drugs. Yeah. You can't yeah. run from this stuff. You become different. Yes. Yes. You become Amen. different. So 1 John 1 tells us walk in the light as he's in the light. 1 John 2. 1 John 2. I'm just showing you this thing. It's, John has this revelation. It's actually verse 6. If you're taking notes, 1 John 2, 6, it says, He who says, he who says he abides in the Lord, in him, well, then he ought to walk just as the Lord walked. Wow. <laughs> so, do you believe your Bible? Yes. Because it's 1 John 2. Yes. Or are you a yellow butt person, an analytical person? Do you talk around the word and say, well, you know, he couldn't really literally mean that because he's the Lord and we and nobody's really and he couldn't have meant that. And then we misunderstand that he wants to put his spirit in us and restore us back to what he created us to be so we can walk in the light as he's in the light. Why? Because we were made for his image. Yeah, that's why Jesus said, this isn't our sermon, it's not Gerald's sermon. Jesus said. You're the light of the world. So if you were the enemy, 
Wouldn't you be okay if they go to church and even do all night prayer as long as they don't shine? That's right. Yes. yes. And let them wrap their identity in the Christian things they do instead of the Christ they reveal. Yes. yes. Woo, that's convicting. <laughs> if you were the enemy, wouldn't you do that? Wouldn't you get them to wrap their identity yeah. into Christian service, initiative trips, and feeding the poor? But just never let their heart be free. Make sure they're self-centered. Make sure they have opinions and impressions that aren't positive. And make sure the light just never really shines. But they do church stuff, but they just ain't her. No, that's exactly what happens. Because yeah. when you're discouraged, you ain't shining. When you're self-centered, you ain't shining. When you're self-centered, you're self-centered. Yeah. Yeah. And it's all about you see two people talking and you're so insecure, you think they're talking about you. Yeah. Yeah. And then you actually believe it. Now you have a little disdain towards so sister so-and-so. You know, I need to talk about her and her too. She probably got me on her list. <laughs> and now when you say hi, you don't even mean it. Nobody it happens like that. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> Not cool. I'll tell you, it would be good to be selfless. Yes. He who says he abides in him. So I'm hitting you with all this stuff because now I'm going to wrap it up with how do we get there? How do we live like that? How do we walk even as he walked? See, it doesn't say somewhat like he walked. Did you, did you guys look at it? Did anybody go there and actually make sure I'm telling you what it says? In the same yeah. as he walked. Yes. Bingo. What translation is that? New American Standard. Okay, so that's good. I'll take that. Here's New King James. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. That would be in the same manner. Amen. Is he making any distinguishment, difference, or say, is he doing this at all? Or is he saying same? Same. There's no limitation there. So the limitation is found in us. Which means if he's saying that, there's grace to live that. You want my words tonight? I'm going to say a lot and through the thing. The number one way our lives are going to change and you become love, you have to want to become love. Love's got to be first. You have to become, want to become love. So walking in the light... Abide in him, walk in the light as he's in the light. Abide in him and walk in even as he walk. He's talking about love the whole time. Amen. He's not talking about just power, miracles. and He's talking about the heart of God. Yes. Amen. Are you following me? Yes. You have to want to become love. I know that sounds strange because we all say, well, we all want to come up. I've met tons of people that go to church that are in leadership, that have positions and titles. And when it comes right down to it, they don't want to become love. They want to talk what brother so-and-so did. They still can't get over what happened here. They still believe so-and-so should be of a higher standard. And they're not even realizing they're letting where people aren't always dictate where they are. And they're under the control of the weakness of our lives. And what it boils down to is you really don't want to become love. You don't want to forgive and forget and move forward. You want to have issues in a conversation. You want to tell brother so-and-so what brother so-and-so said. And it comes out of your mouth. And when it comes out of your mouth, it means you're trying to get a response and support because you have feelings about it. Love covers a multitude of sin. Doesn't whisper in a corner and say, I'm only telling you this so you can pray. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to preach it, girl. <laughs> Are you all alright? Yeah. Well, you know I'm telling the truth. I've been in this thing long enough. And if we're living that way, how are we going to impact the world? Come on, God. The average Christian that I've noticed has a survival mentality and they're only a Christian hoping God makes their life go better. And the circumstances of their life is the dictation of their disposition, their outlook, and their enthusiasm. And most people that go to church are only as encouraged as life is going in the moment. Yep. And when you ask a Christian how they're doing, they'll tell you their biggest trials instead of their relationship. Yep. That's a giveaway. Yep. Did you ever hear people say, well, keep me in prayer, it's been a real wilderness place. Did you ever hear Christians talk about being in a wilderness? Yep. And they get all, they look all sun chapped when they say it. They're like, I'm tired. In wilderness. Well, you must be in the Israelites' wilderness. <laughs> Where all they thought about was themselves. Come on. Yeah. You probably want to get over here in Jesus' 40 day deal instead of this 40 year deal. Where you cycle and never get out. Because the Holy Spirit immediately led Jesus into the wilderness of water baptism. Yes. 
Yep. That's right. Why? So as a man, he can fulfill in 40 days what they failed for 40 years. Wow. Wow. So he went into the same wilderness, yeah, tempted the yep. same, Preaching devil, oh. circumstances, adversity, weather. And the devil comes in. So, so when you say, you're saying it's the wrong fellow, you say, well, I've been going through a lot of this place. I'm going to jump over here in Jesus' wilderness. <laughs> Where you come out in the spirit and power, you crush the devil with the word, and you got angels ministering to you. Yes. Oh, yes. That doesn't sound yes. sunburned and dried up. No. <laughs> the Israelites' wilderness is because it'd be better for us. 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 You read the story. Yeah. It'd be better for us. Yes. They complained daily, practically yeah. daily. When you complain, catch this, you reveal. It's all about you and your preferences. And your preferences matter more than manifesting Jesus. That's what complaining is. When you're not self-centered, you don't know how to complain. Unfortunately, we think complaining is a normal part of life. Complaining is perversion. Because it's an expression of me thinking for me. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, New Testament, mm. don't you complain like they did and get destroyed by a destroyer. Yeah. Mm. So did God initiate the destruction? <coughs> or did their complaining set the platform for destruction? So now watch what happens. So a complainer sets the platform for destruction, and when destruction comes, then they complain about the destruction, and ultimately their complaining is directed to God. And it's a vicious cycle of deception. Yep. Now they're shipwrecked, they're not having intimacy, and their light is far quenched. Yep. And they still go to church because they don't want to totally disconnect, and they hang around Him, but they don't manifest Him. Yep. That's tragic. Come on, I'm talking real straight and plain to rescue us from stuff. Too. It's admonitions. Paul said, I write these things for your admonition. I write these things so you don't fall into the same trap. Amen. Amen. I'm not, I'm not preaching this because you're doing it. I'm preaching so you don't. Yes. Are you hearing me? Yes. A lot of times people think everything the preacher's preaching is because it's in the room. No, it's so it never gets in the room. That's right. Yes. yes. Right? <laughs> so we study, show ourselves approved. We're not unaware of the enemy's devices, and we give him no place. And he who keeps himself, the evil one touches him not. The rule of this world cometh, touches me not. Sounds like he only takes what we give him. Yep, yep. It's all he can take. Yep. Come on. Yeah. That's right. And if your life's not your own, Come on. and you're truly submitted for the kingdom, then he doesn't even have access to your life. That's yep. right. That's right. And I guess the sign of that is zero fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. yeah. And I guess this fear is still a sign of I'm thinking for me, my own well-being. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you settle in your heart, you ain't never going to die, and it ain't about physical death. Amen. I wonder if you settle in your heart, you ain't never going to die. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you ain't going to let something petty, like what he said, what she said, well, that hurt. Well, I'm going to let them get away with that. <laughs> wow. And all of a sudden, that stuff sounds so trivial. Yeah. Because of what we're here for. Yeah, yeah. But I've been in this thing and at the leadership level and preaching for quite a while. And I'm not excited to tell you this, but the stuff I'm talking about is all over the place and prevalent, and a lot of people think it's normal. And we're praying for revival and outpourings and God to move. And He's just wanting us to get a revelation of who we are in Him and what He paid for. Yes. And actually start believing with the light instead of in need of a deeper blessing. Because the day you wake up and believe you're a light, it'll shine. That's right. <laughs> yeah? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the day you wake up and believe nobody owes you a thing, not even your kids, man. You're on the earth to manifest Christ. Picture this, parents. You're on the earth, and you reproduce after your own kind. And you have children, and now you have this great privilege of manifesting to your children what Christ can look like in people that believe. 
And your children get to grow up with that visual and that example and that heritage and that history. And now it's not just a bunch of spiritual lectures and it's not just a bunch of preaching scripture, Adam. It's actually living Christ right in front of us. Right. And even when you make a mistake, you take ownership, you weep, you hold them, you tell them you're working and growing and you show them what humility looks like, you teach them what repentance looks like, you show them it ain't about perfection, but it is about purity and the pure in heart shall see the Lord. Yes. Yes. You see what you can do for your children? Yes. What an honor. That sure beats, slap them, get on your nerves, or crossing the line, that, or drawing a line that they can cross, and now you're just saying, Billy, get to your room. Please don't ever correct or discipline your children in frustration. <laughs> ever. God would never do that to you because he'd never be frustrated. When you, when, you, when you discipline your children in frustration, you're teaching them that you have lines to cross and your affection is conditional and as quick as they can earn it, they can lose it. And I know we think, yeah, yeah, but I still always love you. You just rubbed me wrong. <laughs> Don't correct your children in frustration. Get a grip on your heart, take a walk, go in the bathroom yes. and understand before you open your mouth. And make sure it's never about you and a line you drew that they crossed. Why? Because you can correct and discipline your children. It can't be because they crossed your line. It has to be because they're more than what they're living. And they have to understand the correction is all about them becoming the beauty of what they're empowered to be. It's never because they crossed my boundary. Is that good? Quick? Clear? Yes. That's just a mini parental conference. <laughs> just a minute, that's a minute. But you'll take that, that's good stuff. Because what? You got four children and two in the same calendar year. All of a sudden you can talk yourself in to certain... No, watch this. No, I'm just being real. All of a sudden you can talk yourself into certain emotions and feelings and reactions the way you handled it. And now you justify it. And then she might look at and say, well, you know, you got me here all day with them kids. I know you got a busy job. But you know what it's like sometimes? I got four of them running. Blah, blah, blah. And every once in a while, I can only get so much. Sometimes it's tough, tough, tough. I just... <laughs> <laughs> so you don't want that theology. <laughs> amen? amen? Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> I would <have> never. <laughs> see, see when, you, when you correct or discipline a child, you have to make sure it's clear that the reason you're correcting them is because you believe they're way more than the attitude they have. They're way more than what they're doing. They're way yes. more than the behavior they're displaying. You, you can in that, you teach them the importance of family and how we all together make up the whole of something beautiful. Yes. And when something gets out of joint, it doesn't work right and it affects the whole wheel. Yes. Right? Just a simple tire or rim gets bent or out of balance. It's still rolling, but it ain't efficient. <laughs> right? So you teach children the value of family and that we're part of something, that they're a valuable part. The reason I'm correcting you because I see you as part of this wheel. Yeah. You get it? Yeah. So correction and discipline should always be for their sake. Because yeah. you're teaching them their way more than the way they're <coughs> acting out. Do you get it? Yes. yes. And frustration teaches a whole different thing. It just teaches you have boundaries, you have lines, they cross them, so they learn to live around your boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not cool. Yeah. Most parents parent there. I'm just saying, you don't have to. And if you've parented there, you're not condemned by this. No. Yeah. You're inspired to relook at it and Amen. say, wow, there's a higher way. Yes. Because who knows in time your children will get the message. Wow, repentance, change, this is different. Wow, I believe that. And all of a sudden, wow, Daddy, you don't do this anymore. Well, God really spoke to my heart and realized I was taking some things personal. And you know what, buddy? You don't owe me anything. We didn't have you so you could live your life for me. We have you so we can manifest Christ to you so you can walk in the light and manifest Christ in your life. Yes. We had you to multiply who he is in us. Yes. And we're honored that you're our boy. Yes. And daddy's just been growing and learning. But thanks for acknowledging and seeing. Oh, daddy, you're really different. I mean, I remember a time. Yeah, yeah, we'll just forget that time, son. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know what I'm saying? Yes. Who knows that in time, 
You, even your child doesn't just hold on to the mistake you made. They actually realize you grew beyond that mistake. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. People do that with their work testimony. They think, well, I blew it at work. You only blew it if you never take on change. Come on. <laughs> you, can, you can change now. You could have worked there five years, ten years as a confessing Christian. You could have been a 007 secret agent Christian. <laughs> you could have been a total misrepresentation of Christ. And all of a sudden your heart gets convicted. Lord, no. And, and, and all of a sudden you go back into work. And you're different. And they say, man, we're not you. Man, I just have some strong convictions. I haven't followed what I believe like I could. And, and I was just getting caught up in feelings, emotions, and stuff. And I feel like I've done you guys injustice. And you might even find yourself weeping. And they're thinking, what is going on with you? You don't need to cry about that. You're cool, man. We like you the way you are. No, I don't like me the way I am. And blah, blah, blah. And I'm just... And all of a sudden, six months goes by. And six months of consistency and walking in the light. All of a sudden, you know, in the beginning, they might be bringing up the last six years. But about after six months or so, all of a sudden, they didn't even remember the last six years because the last six months is right in front of them. You see? So it's never too late to get up and live God. Are you with me? Yes. You didn't blow your testimony unless you fail to get up and pursue it. I've had a lot of people I talk about testimonies and work and they say, well, it's too late for that. I blew my testimony. Because I'm this and I'm that at work and I had a fallout. So so. Okay, so go in there and live humble and repent. And when they ask you what's going on, tell them what's going on in your heart. And they criticize that, persecute that behind the scenes. But five, six months from now, a year from now, you're walking out steadfast. They ain't going to have much to say. Right. You see? Let me tell you, I, I ain't talking about nothing but being a believer. Yes. Amen. Because if we believe this book, then we're pursuing to live that way. Now, if we're just asking God for blessings and favor and He's our table waiter, Come on. Oh. no wonder we ain't tipping in the state wasn't even the way I want it. Now you're a complaining Christian. you got issues with God. I wonder what He's trying to teach you all the time. He's trying to teach you to get over yourself so He can live through you. <laughs> get out of the way. I'm just telling you, the greater portion of people I've met have this idea imposed to them by teachers and leaders that God's here for our sake instead of us for His great name. Wow. And most people go to church for what He can do for them instead of how He can make them more like Him. And it's totally backwards. He's not your genie in a bottle. He's not your wish maker. He's not your bus driver. He's the father of all creation. Amen. Yeah. <coughs> he who says he abides in no matter what, himself walk even as he walked. Look at this one, 1 John 3. It's chapter after chapter after chapter in John. John had a revelation. He says. Beloved, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us is verse 1. 1 John 3, 1. I didn't get into a lighthouse rules. I'm assuming those that want to be there are there. <laughs> Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we... 1 John 3, 1. Yes. That we should be called... The, the, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world doesn't know us because it didn't know Him. And beloved, we are children of God. And it hasn't yet been revealed. He's talking about the full measure right now. It hasn't yet been revealed what we shall be. Like the full measure of what we shall be. But we know this. That when we, when He is revealed, we shall be like Him. <laughs> For we shall see Him as He is. So if I can take that truth and see Him as best as I can see Him now through the life He demonstrated, the words He spoke, and the manifestation of the Father in His life, and the things He called me to, I get a pretty good look at Jesus. Amen. Now I got the full revelation on what He's going to be when He comes and what I'm going to be in Him then. But man, I can walk in what I see now. Yes. So in all our getting, get understanding. Paul said to make all see. Some people read that and say, see, we're just in the dark now. We just see in part. We just have a partial revelation. Well, let your partial revelation be amazing enough to transform your life. Amen. Amen. There's no limit in what he's saying. It's actually amazing what he's saying. <laughs> so watch this. Watch this. So, so we know. We know. We're supposed to know this, people. I'm not sure how many Christians are even thinking about this in the last 10 years of their Christian life. We're supposed to know it. We're supposed to know that when He is revealed, we're going to be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Now watch. And anyone or everyone who has this hope,
hope in him purifies himself kind of like he's pure. Just. Just. Wow. Yes. 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 What's it say? Just as. Just as? Just Wait, we're talking about the Lord. Yes. yes. You mean scripture is bold enough to say as he is pure, so you be pure. Just as he is pure, you be pure. I was taught my whole life that's impossible. I was told my whole life that that's him and this is us. Nobody ever told me we're one. Nobody ever told me he paid to put the same spirit in me that raised Christ from the dead, except that it was positional. Come on. Nobody ever told me it was actual and that I could actually live it and follow him. Yeah. Oh my goodness, but the word of God says, if I have that hope, I'm going to purify myself just like he's pure. Ah! Amen. You guys see what's wrong with me? <laughs> days. This ain't a few months. Can you see passion in me? Yes. I suppress it, believe it or not, <laughs> to communicate. <laughs> because I've lived it so long, I cannot be passionate. It's real. It's not my doctrine. Real. It's not theology. It's not my precepts. Come on. <laughs> it's the life I'm enjoying and living. Yes. Amen. Yeah. So I'm a maniac. <laughs> I get so many first impressions. I get judged so much by people. They see me. They'll be watching like someone on YouTube. Someone friend will say, "Hey, check him out." And I'll say, "He's too much for me. Ain't nobody gonna be that. Ain't nobody gonna be that. Ain't nobody that." Because our hearts are so jaded by life yeah. that we think there's so much. No, there's no such thing as pure joy. The Bible says it's joy unspeakable. Yes. I don't even know if I've seen that in Christians. Oh. Joy unspeakable. Not seeing people trying to act joyful. <laughs> but joy unspeakable, joy that you can't even explain. <laughs> Good tidings of Okay, so what's the angel say when Jesus is born, Pastor? Behold, I bring you I'm bringing you good news. I'm bringing you a story. It's tidings. And it's great joy. Yes. And he's going to be to yes. all. How many? All. So at least this room's covered. <laughs> so you can't get out of this. No. So watch this. He's going to bring you good tidings of great joy. So watch. The evidence of understanding the good tidings is the great joy it's producing. That's right. Because it's good tidings of. <laughs> so the great joy is the child of the tidings, like... Uh -huh. <laughs> Did you get it? Yeah. So the fruit of understanding the good tidings is the great joy. Yeah. Yeah. Now when you look at folks that go to church, you understand a whole lot of them don't understand the good tidings. <laughs> they wonder why their life is going the way it is and when God's going to show up and I thought Pastor, he was going to do me right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. I got y'all good. Come on, there's no way out of this. I'm preaching, man. I'm reading scripture after scripture after scripture. This ain't my sermon. You can't even blame me on this one. <laughs> scripture after scripture after scripture. He's going to pure himself what? Purify himself what? Just as I was taught my whole life there's no way that's possible. That's considered heresy in a lot of people's minds. Yeah. That right there won't fly in 90% of God congregations and gatherings. I wish I was wrong, but I don't think it is wrong. I, that, 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 if you preach that, people was eyebrowing. Who does he think he is? He should be more highly than you are. And I'm not thinking higher than I ought. I'm thinking what he said. Yes. 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 Like Paul, he writes to the saints. He writes to the saints, yeah. Philippi and Colossae. Colossian. He's not writing to those who are about to sin and need the blood any moment. 
Do those imperfect vessels that are by the mercy of God accepted by the skin of their teeth? He's writing to the saints. <laughs> right? This is going to get you, and then I'm going to have to finish my message. But I'm just setting you up. <laughs> First John 4, you all right? Yes. You guys all right? Yes. Great. I love First John. I got my Bible so colored, and all these colors mean something. Everywhere you see purple, it's Christian commandments. It's things I'm supposed to walk in and live because of Christ. Do you see how much purple's just on those? Purple's the number one color in my Bible. It, to do the New Testament thoroughly, it takes me three and a half to four pencils of purple to color every condition, commandment, and Christian conduct that's in your Bible. Yes. So this is a whole lot more than praying a prayer and holding on tight and waiting for the bell to ring. That's right. <laughs> if the number one color in my Bible is Christian conduct, then there has to be a response of life in Christ yes. to salvation. Yeah, and not just your name in a book for when you die. Yes. The number one color. Purple, I promise. But you see all that green? Oh, you see blue? You know, oh, see the orange? Guess what orange is? I'm excited. I'm excited. Orange is a promise. You see the purple above the orange or below it? The purple is what you walk in and what you receive if you walk in it. It's so, it's so fun to do that. You read and you realize some of the promises are hinged on conditions. Love's not conditional, but a lot of promises are. The first promise, the first commandment with a promise is children. Honor your father and your mother. It'll be well with you, and life will be long. So if a child doesn't honor their mother and father, then they might step out of the grace of being well, and they might step out of the grace of life being long. So if he gives a promise that life will be long, it doesn't mean, who's ever heard people say, when your time cards out, honey, you're punished. Like that case of time, like you have a day when you're going to die. You don't have an expiration there is no such thing in scripture. Yeah. No. It says it's appointed once for man to die. It doesn't say there's an appointed time for man to die. Yeah. Yeah. So it's actually scripturally very possible to add to your days or subtract. Yeah. 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 Now, sometimes life just comes, tragedies come, car wrecks come. I'm not implying that people are always responsible for their, their dying day. What I'm saying is, if he says, children, this is the first commandment of the promise, honor your father and mother, then we would, we would be wise to pay respect to that and submit and surrender to that to receive the back end of that. Right. Yes. And if we don't, then we aren't guaranteed the back end of that. That's all I'm saying. But if he says to a child, you honor your mother and father, and life will be long with you. If he says in Psalms 91, he said, he said because you've honored me and known me, he said, I, I, I will satisfy you. And with long life, I, and you've known my name, with long life, I will satisfy you. Mm -hmm. We wonder if you don't live out that thing in Psalms 91. You might not have that promise. Hezekiah was ready to die, and he turned his face to the wall and cried out to God in sincere repentance. And God said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you 15 more years to walk it out. Yeah. I'll give you a chance to walk out your repentance. 15 more years. Mm -hmm. He added to his days through yeah. true repentance. Yeah. Yeah. Esau found a place for repentance even though he bitter, wept bitterly with tears. How come Esau couldn't find a place for repentance when his repentant kingdom of God saying, why couldn't he? Because he never cried in repentance. He cried in sorrow for himself. He only cried because what his sin cost him. Yep. Yes. Yes. Wow. Yes. Yes. And he found no place to be changed. He said, let no man profane like Esau be found among you. Somebody that will compromise their birthright and inheritance for an occasion in the flesh and only cry for what their sin cost them. Yep. Instead of cry for the kingdom of God. Yeah. And how their sin affected others and stumbled young Christians and all that stuff. I'm throwing a lot out at you. I'm yeah. Keep throwing. Keep throwing. Yeah. Keep throwing. <laughs> all that purple Christian commandment, all that green is love. That's love. Green is the love of God. Look at this. Watch this. I'm excited. Watch. Ooh. Ain't that dirty? <laughs> so every once in a while, I'll just open my Bible and just read green. I'll just start reading green. I'll be like, <laughs> I'll just read green. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Y'all ready for this? Yes. yes. 
1 John 4. You all ready? Huh? What's blue? Work of the Holy Spirit. Woo, wow. It was a little blue, wasn't it? Well, you saw that little blue, didn't you? Oh, Holy Spirit, he's on every page. Bam, bam. Red, redemption, righteousness, the work of the blood. Oh, my Bible is pretty. Yeah. Now, if you find my Bible laying somewhere, don't you steal it. You're a Christian. <laughs> don't you steal it. Don't you say it's a gift from the Lord. <laughs> I got this old hardback because they stopped printing these Bibles. I got this old hardback. It was the only one I could find in my bookstore had it at church because they know I use this Bible, so a lot of people were using it through the kingdom school and stuff because they like the translation and, and, they, and they wanted the same Bible, so they were carrying them. All of a sudden, they were out of print. And I was in Tennessee and I gave my Bible to a lady. So what I do is I mark them all up and then at some point, they're getting pretty old and tattered, but they all mark up. They got all my notes, the side column notes. And, and then what I do is I usually give it to a uh, new believer. Wow. And I just say here, and my first Bible I gave away to a nine-year-old who just received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Oh, yes. Just sitting there weeping, praying in tongues, and the Lord said, give her your Bible. It was the first one I ever gave away. It was so marked up. I treasured that Bible. I mean, I loved that Bible. And it was like, oh, I gave it away. First little girl she told me, he told me to give it away to was a month or two before that. I actually coveted my Bible. And I went home, and I was like, man, God, I know you told me to give that Bible. It's good. I said, I'm sorry. He said, you ain't sorry. You still have the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> see, how we, see how we sell ourselves? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. If you ain't sorry. You still got the Bible. <laughs> Track her down. Find her. Give it to her. Make it right. Then you're sorry. I never did. I just held on to it. Two months later, I'm praying for this nine-year-old. He gave me another chance. Because I wasn't ready to let it go. I treasured that. That was my first Bible after I got saved. I had that thing so marked up. He said, I want you to give your Bible to that little girl. I didn't even hesitate. I closed it up, but I visited. I said, honey, I said, the Lord just told me to give you this Bible. It's going to help you. I have a class here to cover her. His, her mom, you know moms. She's behind me. He's <laughs> 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 hyperventilating. Give me this Bible, baby. Give me this Bible, baby. Ah, she was crying. You know what that mom told me? That little girl came home from school three months straight. Crawled in a recliner, opened that Bible, and sat there for two, three hours every day. Yes. Cross-referencing, looking, colors, reading. Nine years old, praying in tongues. She got my Bible. <laughs> so then I'm marking Bibles up, and I thought, yeah, I'm just going to do this. I start marking them up and giving them to a new brother. So this one's getting pretty old. This one I should have given away probably a long time ago. But I haven't heard to give it away any time specific, but... A lady in Tennessee I gave my Bible to. So I ran and got this old hardback. Because it's the only one I got. Now since I found a surplus of this Bible, and I got three of them. <laughs> so that's going to be trouble because I'm going to live a long time. <laughs> so it's going to be trouble. You get used to your Bible pages. I know, I know my Bible just by looking at the page. You can cover everything. Turn to my Bible and I probably can tell you what book and page it's on. Because I'm so used to my Bible and it's colored in the way it looks, I, I appear this. If you hand me your Bible, I'll feel like it ain't even a Bible. <laughs> like, and you hear me quote scripture, and you know I know where stuff is, but it still just doesn't even look like because I'm so used to my Bible. But uh, you got you got to check this out. This hit me years ago. You all ready for this? Yeah. It's a little children's church song. We made it a children's church song. Who knows the children's church song? Beloved, let us love one another. Anybody ever hear that song? For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. Nobody ever heard that song? Yeah. He who loveth God, was singing it. He knoweth not God, for God is love. See, this is a song, ain't it? Now listen to this. Beloved, look at, look at verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. Why in the world would I love him? Why would I love her? Because we're all God's Beloved, children. let us love one another, for God is love. Everyone, everyone, not most, everyone who loveth reveals this. It doesn't say the word revealed there, but it's what it means. That you're born of God, and because you love, it reveals you actually know God. Amen. Now look at verse 8. 
If you love us not, guess what it reveals? God. You don't know God. He didn't say you don't see your need for a Savior. He didn't say you weren't sincere about the repentance and forgiveness of your sins. He didn't say you don't go to church. He didn't say you're not a pastor. He didn't say you're not an itinerant minister. He didn't say you don't go on mission trips. And he didn't say you never give to the poor. But guess what he did say? If you don't love, there's one reason, not one of two. You don't know him like you could. Ain't that something? Welcome to Adam Holman. <laughs> <laughs> Is that convicting? So the measuring stick of knowing God, the barometer in our lives of knowing God, is the love that we walk in. Ain't that something? Yes. What did Jesus call eternal life? Knowing the Father, knowing God. He didn't call eternal life a prayer to pray that he takes us to heaven and puts our name in the book of We said that. He said, God the Father is going to give eternal life to as many as he's given me. And this is eternal life. That you might know him. Yes. The only true God. What's eternal life? Knowing the eternal one. Eternal life isn't just your name in a book. All life that could be impersonal, and you could believe that for the rest of your life and never have fellowship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. and now you're living your life on the faith of a principle instead of walking out your life in a relationship. Mm -hmm. Watch what he said. We always say, Jesus, the way to heaven, Jesus, the way to heaven. He didn't even say that. Yeah. He's the way, the truth, and, and the life, life. and no one and comes to the Father but the Son through me. So, who is Jesus? The way back to the Father. Yeah. Why is this important? Because he made man for his image and sin separated man and God. And Jesus took away sin so man and God could be rejoined again. And we turned it into a blessing we received called heaven when we die. Instead of a relationship restored through the blood and cross of Jesus. What's that? Is what one? Yeah. 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 Totally. Like. When God sees us, what's he see? Does he see where Gerald went, did, it wasn't good no. at all? He sees no. Gerald all the time for who he created him to be, who he right. called him to, and, and what he's willing him to be. As Gerald yields to that and becomes that, two are becoming one, and now Gerald becomes the total manifestation of everything God intended from the beginning. Yes. And it was all made possible through the cross of Jesus Christ. Yes. This is the purpose of the cross, to restore purpose and destiny and expression. We've turned it into something we get from him instead of what we become. Yes. See, you don't put new wine in the old wine skin. You gotta make the wine skin new. Or the wine won't contain. And it'll spill out through cracks and seams. Now you're not people say, well, I just need filled because we leak. You're not supposed to leak through cracks. <laughs> well, we need filled because we leak. Fill the hole. My cup runneth over. Oh, yeah. He floods the dry ground because he fills the thirsty. Oh, yeah. Woo! Yeah. 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 yeah? So you get so full that somebody's getting wet. Come on. And it ain't because you're trying to minister, it's because you're pouring over. Yes. 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 That's why you aren't going dry. Yes. Yes. Did you notice I'm not going dry this weekend? <laughs> the wear of the day on me? No. Can you see my cup is just about dry, John? No. See these Christians no. freak me out when I travel. They surround me and say, oh, he's poured out and poured out. God, would you please just fill him up? I'm like, stop praying that stuff. <laughs> If you're drinking out of my overflow, I am soaking wet. Oh, yes. 
dry. I'm 28 years in ministry and I don't even know what it means to be dry. Woo. I don't know what it means to be burdened by people and overwhelmed and tired and take a break and fill back up. <laughs> I don't even know what they're talking about. So when I get in a green room and they're all talking like that, I gotta stay quiet because I think I'm high minded. <laughs> They think I'm trying to show off. And I'm not being real. People will say about how much they travel. They'll look at me and say, well, you know what I'm talking about. You travel all the time. And I'm thinking, I have no idea. <laughs> but I don't say nothing. Because they'll think I'm trying to be haughty. So you just stay quiet. Yes. Yes. Can you tell I'm not putting on an act? Can you tell I believe this? Yes. Oh, it empowers me. I'm going to go to bed this way, wake up this way. If you ever see me again, I'll be this way. I'm going to be worse. <laughs> you know why it might be worse? Because I might like know him a little more. Yes. 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 See, this isn't my theology. You see a relationship. Yes. yes. That's what he paid for. Yes. yes. And the barometer of me knowing him is my love. Yes. And he says, what? So it's not condemning. It's convicting. Causing us to grow and change. Because it says, if you don't love, the problem lies with your relationship and how much you know. Mm -hmm. Not know about him. There's a big difference between knowing him, about him and knowing him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I live beside a lady. She's my neighbor. I've been in my house now. Whew, this June will be 38 years in my same little old house. Mm -hmm. Paid for since I was 42. It's just hard to move. <laughs> <laughs> I could move. I just sit this home and I got a mortgage. Amen. It's, just, it's, just, it's a little modest house, but oh, man, it just works for us. Yes. I got this neighbor for 30 couple of those years. She's passed now. She was 94. She loves us. Oh, she still loves us. Yes. We had work done on the awning and had, the, had the, some of the stuff wrapped and used an overhand wrapped out front. And, and, and you know how the construction guys will put their little advertisement sign in the front yard? Mm -hmm. She came out one day, I, I looked out the window and she's standing in her driveway, just sobbing and crying. And I thought, what happened? I thought somebody died. I thought, she's standing in her driveway. <laughs> she thought you're moving. And I, yeah. I, I ran out and ran across and said, Ann, honey, what's wrong? What's going on? She said, I didn't know you were moving. <laughs> <laughs> that sure beats her doing cartwheels, saying, <laughs>
I've just met her. <laughs> and I'm getting to know her. But I don't know her that much, but I can already laugh and talk about her and make you laugh and be pretty accurate. Yeah, yeah. But watch this. Yeah. If I came and moved in with them for the next week, Come on, you run and scream. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, and we just hung out together. We just hung out together for, for seven more days. Just hung out together. And then for some reason, I ended up there a whole other week. And after that second week, somebody would come to you and you said, say, do you know Della? Do you know Greg? It wasn't because I just said hi at the White House. I could affectionately answer and sincerely answer why. Because I've been with them. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. 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 <laughs> What's your name? KJ. KJ. I'm glad that song woke you up. KJ. <laughs> now listen, now listen. I don't know you at all. We just said hi the other yesterday. Or this morning. I was just this morning. So I don't know you at all. I had to ask your name again. KJ. So all I can tell you was he takes afternoon naps. That's all I know about him. <laughs> and I would say I'm somewhat accurate. <laughs> but anyway, so I really don't know you at all. But if somebody said, do you know KJ? He's down there at the lighthouse in Pensacola. When you were down there, did you know KJ? Oh my goodness, I said hi to KJ. I met KJ. So I know you're real. I know you're a real guy. You can't talk me out of that. But I don't know you. But if we hung out together, if I ran with you, if we worked together for a month, if we took a couple long drives on trips and delivered something together, and we just chatted and talked, in a week's time, my, yeah, I know KJ would be different than my, oh, yeah, I know KJ. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. This is the importance of communion and fellowship with yes. God. Yes. And, and as young as these children are, they can start that. Yes. We can teach them that. We can all have that. We can lay on our bed and talk to him. We we'll wake up in the morning and talk to him. I tell people, put a sticky note on your mirror if you have to. If you get distracted by the flesh, feelings, and tough night's sleep, and the circumstance of the day, and you find yourself at 10.30 realizing, oh yeah, there's a God, or at 1.30, oh, I'm a Christian. <laughs> put a sticky note on your mirror somewhere that you know you'll see it. Tell people, put a sticker somewhere. We love you. Remember who you are. Just a little trigger point. Remember who you are. Put a little note. Don't you walk out of this house without knowing him. Do something to trigger your heart and soul this way. Yes. So you don't get out of bed and put on your flesh shoes before you ever wear your spirit. Come on. Yes. You put on your spirit now when you open your eyes and you get out and your flesh will benefit. Yeah? Yes. So you got to get to know him. He said, this is imperative. He said, if we don't love, we don't know God because God is love. Amen. So you know what this tells me also? God doesn't love us just to love us. That's right. Now he has to because he's love. He is love. He loves. It's what he does. But it's not his main goal it isn't just to love us so we're loved. He doesn't just forgive us so we're forgiven. Yeah. He doesn't just show us mercy so we can say we obtained it. That's half the testimony. The reason he loves us like he loves us is so we become the same extension and expression of that love. Yes. Yes. The reason he forgives you is so you become forgiveness. Yes. The reason he shows you mercy is so you become merciful because you've been so touched by the beauty of it. Yes. So it ain't just for you to embellish and say, oh, he showed me mercy, and then no show mercy to somebody. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it's not for you to walk around and be forgiven of everything you've ever done, and you hold on against your brother. Matthew 18 says that mentality is evil and wicked. Yes. Yeah. To want something from God and not have the heart to become it to others. He calls it in Matthew 18, evil and wicked. That's the, that's the word. That's not my sermon. Amen. Come on. Yes. This thing is real. Yes. Mm -hmm. If I don't love, I have one reason. Not one of many. No, I don't have to take inventory. If I don't love, I just don't know him like I could because he's not. Watch. In this, 
the love of God was revealed or seen or manifested towards us. That God has sent His only begotten Son. Remember last night when I prayed over people at the very end, I said, can you do this one thing? I said, say in your heart, I know you love me. Yes. Or you'd have never sent your Son. Do you know, people going through adversity, the first thing they get tempted to do is question His love. They get a diagnosis they were hoping to never get in their whole entire life, and now they got it. And they're like, where are you at, God? It's not you love me. And the first thing they do is question His love. That's dangerous because you're rooted in the ground of love and faith works through love. As soon as you question love, now you're already going to move by despair. What you have to be sure of when you get that diagnosis or, test or prognosis is you have to know He loves you. Because faith is found in that knowing. And faith works through that love. Yes. Faith doesn't work because you have a need. Faith works because you have a relationship. Are you with me? Yes. Yes. Most people are praying in despair. And most people are moved by the problem when they pray. And a lot of the things we say is just our fear with language. And then we add a scripture to it to make it sound spiritual. We call that prayer. As soon as you fear something, you lose your authority over it. That's right. You have no authority over what you fear. That's why Jesus said, fear not. You haven't been given a spirit of fear. Because when you fear, it means you're fearing for your Self. And yourself should be dead for the manifestation. Yes. yes. <laughs> you lose all your authority when you fear. And you reduce this to principles you're proclaiming, hoping they work. Now you're quoting a promise book. Come on. Instead of living in truth. Are you guys all right with this? Yes. I'm trying to help you with some stuff. Yes. You have no authority over what you fear. How are you going to pray for a leper if you ever go to a third world country and, and they, 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 you don't even see that stuff in America, but you go to a third world country and you pass away with leprosy and they say, can you help me? How are you going to pray for a leper and lay hands smack on their forehead if you're afraid of getting leprosy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can't have an ounce of afraid of getting leprosy. Mm -hmm. You can't have an ounce of catching the flu and, and getting... COVID. Come on, thank you. Yes. You can't have an ounce. That doesn't make you proud. That means you believe something. Yes. It doesn't mean that, that ever, your whole world crashes if you can diagnose with COVID. You, you just need to know in your conscience you're not living in fear of anything because you love not your own life unto death. You endure hardship as a good soldier. No one enlisted in war entangles itself with the affairs of this life. Why do we have all these scriptures? Because yeah. we're in a war. Yeah. And it's a demon war against the kingdom of God. Yeah. Yeah. And you get to fight on behalf of the king. Yeah. So you're not fighting the devil. You're fighting the good fight of faith. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. So you want to fight something? Fight with faith. And don't change your mind about what you believe no matter what you're going through. And don't put your focus on the devil. Don't give him a platform. Don't give him a microphone. Do you see what happens when you give somebody a microphone? <laughs> don't you give him a microphone. He will manifest. Yes. <laughs> don't give him a mic. Dangerous. The only fight you fight is the good fight of faith. Yeah. How do you resist the devil? Standing steadfast in the faith. You don't walk the floor and bind and rebuke him for two hours and get yourself tired. You don't have to. He already, he already. People say, but what if he's standing in your bedroom? If he wants to listen to me worship a God and torture himself, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> what do I care if he's standing in my bedroom? Amen. He got nothing on me. He wants to stand there and get tormented. <laughs> out by spiritual things and devils and witchcraft and stuff. You're like, eh. <laughs> and sometimes you come out of the grass and, and go, boom. You know why it does? Because we go, ah. <laughs> you ever hide and scare somebody? You can't wait till they turn the corner. You're like, why is that so fun anyway? You gotta hide and wait and they come around and you know how they react. And you got your phone on or somebody's over there. You got your screen set up over there. It's on video. And they come around the corner and you go, what? 
And you're like, ah! <laughs> why do you think the devil comes out of the ground? Yeah. Because you go boom. Or ah, when he goes boom. <laughs> Wonder if you didn't even flinch. <laughs> Wonder if you knew who you were and you stood steadfast in the faith. Yes. Wonder if you heard in your mind that you're still guilty and you're unworthy and that thing you did that you thought maybe God could never forgive you of came back through your mind and you replayed it as if you redid it. Mm. Who knows this happens to people? And when it happens, you just look and smile as if it never happened and say, Father, I'm so glad I can stand clean and washed in your sight. Yeah. I'm so glad you forgave me yeah. what I've ever done. And I thank you, you made me brand new. I read in Colossians, I'm pure, holy, and above reproach. I'm blameless in your sight. Yeah. You love me. And the imp that's speaking this stuff is going, what? <laughs> Come on. Yeah. There's assignments. He's it's like a war line seeking to get giving you flashbacks, memories, impressions. We spent countless hours ministering to people's feelings instead of imparting truth. And we're just praying so they feel better, so they stop remembering, so they stop hearing. You're not in trouble when you hear the past. You're in trouble when you believe the past. Yeah. Yeah. Hearing the past can spring you to the to the truth. You have, a, you have a dream that reminds you of the thing you're forgiven of and you wake up, don't wake up sweating and call a friend for prayer tell have demonic dreams. No! Flip that dream right here. Father, I'm so glad I'm a new creation. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I know where I came from and know where I'm at. You have delivered me. You put new life in me. Yeah. You put a new heart in me. You have truly delivered me. Yeah. If you start responding like that, I bet the little limp that's bringing that dream won't keep bringing the dream. Why? Because you're submitting to God. You're submitting as you're resisting, and he'll flee. Yes. But when you keep calling for prayer, and I can't stand, I'm afraid to go to sleep because the devil keeps messing with my sleep. He keeps giving me evil dreams. Yeah. Well, you're just inviting more dreams. Are you all with me? Yes. you got to flip every moment into a God moment. Yes. It's like Satan's over here. He sees you growing and getting white hot in God. He's like, hey, come here. This little thing comes out. Yeah, boss. <laughs> I, want you, I want you to go. And go, 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 go. Oh, boss, you're so awesome. You're, oh, boss. He goes over there. They're sitting there reading their Bible. they got worship playing in the bedroom. Who's ever had this stuff happen in the middle of worship? Something goofy going through your mind. And then you're tempted to feel better and say, how can I think that in the presence of God? Something must be wrong with yeah. me. Who's ever had this stuff happen? Well, the reason you're aware of it, the reason it bothers you, because it ain't coming from you. And it's looking for an opportune time to get you to analyze and intellectualize and talk yourself into a problem. Yes. So this thing comes. And you're like, and now you're calling your prayer warrior friend. I need prayer. And if they ain't sharp, they'll pray for you. But if they're sharp, they'll say, What do you need prayer for? What do you mean? Well, I'm just hearing these thoughts. Well, listen, honey, I don't think prayer is the issue. I think truth is the issue. Why don't you cast it down with truth? Are those things in your heart? No. Do you feel bad about thinking them? Yeah. But well, don't you get condemned because they didn't come from your heart. The reason you feel bad because your heart's pure and it ain't in your heart. Yes. Yes. Why don't you just thank God with me on the phone right now that you're clean and pure and holy? And Father approach and you said, okay. And then they go, wow, that feels good. Yeah, why don't you say that? And Father, they go, okay, listen, I'm just going to hang up and let you with him. <laughs> <laughs> but what would happen is that thing comes out of here. And you're like, Father, I just thank you so much. And all of a sudden you have this God moment. And this thing's going, what? And Father, I just... And all of a sudden, Jesus starts manifesting this. And he's like, oh, you burn <laughs> So he goes back to the boss. And he says, boss, I did, I did what you said. You told him everything. I said, boss, I told him everything you said. I promise. But what was wrong? You ain't going to believe it. I mean, I told him everything you said. And they began to lift up their hands, their heart, and worship. <laughs> And he began to come in the room I had to run. You fool! You couldn't have said what I said. Because when you talk like that to Christians, they get grayed out, discouraged, and call for prayer. Not this one, boss. Boss, I think this one. 
is a believer. <laughs> So I guess we don't have a problem. We have an answer. Yes, yes. we do. Yes. And we yes, only we have a problem if we make it the issue. Yes. And for waiting for the voices to go away, then maybe we're deceived rather than respond to the voices in truth. So if he's a liar and there's no truth in him, if he says you're not worthy, you must be worthy. If he says you're not going anywhere, you must be heading somewhere. Yeah. If he says you ain't going to make it, you're going to make it. Yes. If he says you're going to die, oh, you're going to live. Yes. <laughs> He's a liar. Yes. He's a liar. Yes. There's no truth in him. And he feeds on self-centeredness. He feeds on fear for yourself. He feeds on self-preservation. But if there ain't no self and we deny ourselves, he ain't got no platform. Now you're like a Christian Teflon pad and you're like, nothing sticks. It just slips and slips and slips. You're a spray pan. <laughs> yeah? Only sticks if you hold it. <laughs> That's it. Why don't you have no Velcro hand? <laughs> so in this the love of God was manifested to us that he sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Yeah. Yeah. Man, how do we miss this stuff? I went to church my whole life and nobody taught me that I lived through him. Mm. In fact, they taught me I could never be like him. Yeah. But I ought to just try to clean up my act and make sure I stay in church. Because if I'm in church when he comes, and I used to think, what if he comes when we ain't having service? <laughs> <laughs> but I was just confused as a child. That we might live through him? And this is love. Not that we loved God. Not that we woke up one day with this bright idea we're going to love God. But that He loved us. And He sent His Son to be mercy for our sins. That's what propitiation means. Mercy seat. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also want to just love one another. Yes. God, this is He making this so like... Guys, this is a given. If He loved us like this, shouldn't we... Love each other the same? Yeah, yes, absolutely. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, then God abides in us, and His love has been perfected in us. And by this we abide in Him. We know that we abide in Him, and He in us. Remember, if we say we abide in Him, then we ought to walk even as He yeah. Now He flips it a little bit. Watch. So if we love like He loves, then we know we abide in Him. Amen. So once we walk in love, we know we abide in Him. Now we say we abide in Him. Why? Because we walk like He walks. Amen. See? Oh. It's all here. Yes. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son... The Savior of the world. Oh, and the end of verse 13 says, because and also because he's given us his spirit. Don't miss that. That's cool. Mm -hmm. We know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. Amen. Now watch this. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son and the Savior, and he's the Savior of the world. Whoever, who? Yeah. Whoever yeah. confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So if you say he abides in you and he does abide in you, then we ought to walk what? Like him, even as he walks. So watch this. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. That's important for every person in this room. Make sure you know and believe the love. For God is love. The reason that's so critical, if you don't see yourself the way he sees you, you will never approach him with confidence. You won't have intimacy with him. You won't get close. Put it this way. This isn't weird. This is spiritual. You won't get close enough to get pregnant. You get it? Uh, when I first got saved, and it wasn't weird, and I'm a guy, and it wasn't weird. And I'm, and I'm not gay, and I'm not, it wasn't weird, it wasn't sexual. I would walk in my bedroom, and I found myself in a season in my life, saying that with nobody in the room, I open myself up to you, come into me, and leave the seat of who you are inside of me, and let everything that comes out of my life look like you. Yes. Yes. That was an intense prayer of mine for a long season. 
Yeah. And I thought God was doing it. Yeah. So if you saw me in the spirit, you didn't know I was with someone. <laughs> I'm about ready to squat down and push, girl. <laughs> yeah. And it was going to look like it's dead. Yeah. It's seed after its own. You know, so when you're with him, you take on who he is. Yes. And who he is comes inside of you and begins to be the manifestation of your life. Yes. So we're never going to walk in love outside of communion with God. Because right. it's not an in your own strength and own desire thing. It's a grace thing. Yes. It's a transformation thing. Yes. It's intimacy. It's a willingness. It's you getting alone with nobody looking. Father, I'm on the earth for one reason to shine. I thank you that you live in me and you love to live in me. You yourself sent the sun into this. You started it and you gave all things pertaining to life and godliness. I yield to you and I thank you for the manifestation of your love in my life and through my life. You talk like that and you live like that and you say things like, nobody owes me a thing and I know I'm on the earth for one reason, God, and it's to shine and walk in love. Thank you for the honor of life in Jesus Christ. Grace will make you that thing you believe. Yes. 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 And you won't have crossroads and you'll get in the middle of life and where something would have hit you and threw you and you had to stop, look, and listen, you won't even see any other options. You walk straight through it because you see one way the, the way. No way. No way. Yeah. And you won't have to deal with your heart and find a healthy balance and, and readjust. I mean, and if you have to do that, thank God you're doing that. But there's a higher way yes. to see and become. To where it's a narrow road. Isn't it amazing? Narrow is the way. Some translations say difficult is the way. Confined is the way. And few are those who find it. He's not talking about Jesus being the way of the Father. He's talking about selflessness. He's talking about coming and loving not your own life unto death. Coming in that way, single eye, and coming, confined is the way. It cost you everything you were never created to be. And we make that some big deal. Pastors and preachers say, this will cost you everything. This is Christian life, and the music's playing there. And you're like, you, 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 you better be serious, because this is a fool's It'll cost you everything. All it costs is what you were never created to be in the first place. Yeah. Right. So you're giving back the lie in exchange for the truth. Why is it so hard to give what you were never created to be? Come on. Why is it so hard to give yourself when you were never made for you? Come on, man. See, we need to preach this more so people can let go of the thing they covet. Yes. Because most people will, but I've met a bunch of people that don't want to become loved when it comes right down to it. They want to hold somebody accountable. They won't forget what their spouse said. They feel like somebody owes them something. Well, I've been in this ministry a long time. I feel devalued. I feel disrespected. And now you're demanding your rights. You're demanding somebody to treat you different. And now you're conditional. That's what happens to people. And what they're saying is, I don't want to become love. And I want to be loved by him. I just don't want to manifest him. Because I feel like I have different rights on the earth. It's twisted. You don't owe me a thing. My disposition isn't dictated by you or your love. Amen. I didn't wake up today for you to love me. I didn't even wake up for you to like me. I, and that doesn't mean I don't want you to. But I woke up to be like him. Yes. And that's the dominating motive of my life. Amen. Yes. So if you owed me something I was finding my value through you, I'm only as good as you're doing me. And now my identity rests on how you love me. And now you're the best thing that ever happened to me. And at the same time, you have the power to break and shatter my heart. Because I'm finding myself in you. And that's how people get broken. Don't get broken. Because he healed the broken heart. Amen. Amen. So we ought to teach people how they don't ever have to be broken again. We think he heals the broken heart, so we say, okay, we're always broke. He heals, we break. He heals, we break. Uh. So pastors have order calls. It's been a tough week. You better work. People say things they shouldn't have. You've been beat down, even your own spouse. I know some of you have been so, and this week is just come up and, and be healed and be fixed. So people come up crying because of their week. It's like we're teaching that people have to be broken. Come on. So they can be fixed. 
Just be fixed. Amen. <laughs> we think that's a move of God. And then they're up there crying their eyes out. Why? Because they don't really have faith to walk back into what just broke. Yeah. So now it's just about feeling better. Instead of seeing different. Come on. A lot of these altar calls are empowering things that yeah. have nothing to do with truth. Yes. They have to do with feelings and emotions. Yep. And at best, we're ministering to men's senses instead of their spirit. Preach. Oh. 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 We're hoping they feel better instead of see clear. And there's a difference. Yes, sir. We have known and believed that the love God has for us and God is love and he who abides in love abides in God and God in you. Now watch this. This is incredible. Love has been perfected among us in this. This is how we know love's perfected among us. <laughs> that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. <laughs> love. Now you follow scripture about the day of judgment and see if that's a day of boldness for people. <laughs> They have dread, gloom, fear, darkness. The souls of men are shook on the day of judgment. There's men that can't face the glory of His presence. There's men that don't know Him, that know they didn't live for Him. There's thieves caught in the night. And there ain't nothing about the day of judgment in your Bible that depicts possible boldness. Except for this scripture. Here's what it says. Here's how you know you've been made complete in what he paid for. Because when he comes, you'll have boldness. Yeah. Not arrogance. Boldness. Yeah. Why? Because as he is. is. What's this whole chapter say? He is. Love. He is. Love. He is. Love. He is. Love. The whole chapter. The reason we have boldness is because as he is, so are we, meaning right now, in this world. Has nothing to do with church attendance. Has to do with living Christ. Has nothing to do with serving in a ministry. Has nothing to do with being an elder on a board. It has to do with living Christ. And when he comes and sees us, guess what he sees? Himself in us. And he sees two that have become one. And we have boldness. Because we're one with him through his blood. Yes. You get it? Yes. <laughs> so the goal of our instruction is love. So we get along, we pray, we seek. It's 10 after 8. I know we started at 6. That doesn't usually mean I have an extra hour, but sometimes I think that. <laughs> <laughs> Can I go to Colossians quickly? Yes. yes. Okay. You guys all right? Yes. Okay, because I said a lot, but I, I don't feel done. Colossians. You can for 10 years setting up for you now. Okay. <laughs> Colossians. You've been... Groomed for this day. God bless you guys. I'm so glad you could come. Thank you for coming. See you, everybody. Yes. Bye bye. No, I'm just saying bye. It was good to see you. I'm glad you all came. Yeah. No, you don't. You don't have. You can go. Yeah. I was just saying hi. Oh, you're not leaving? Oh, okay. I thought she was heading out. I just enjoyed you sitting up front staring at me all night. It looked like you was just listening. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was enjoying you. I know, but you Amen. saw you saw how much I was coming and looking right at you. Amen. Yeah. Amen. I just enjoyed it because I could tell she was like a little sponge. She was <laughs> it was just fun. I just wanted to acknowledge that I was glad she was here. Colossians chapter 3. Y'all should be there now because I gave you a good chance to just get to Colossians, right? <laughs> right? So three's not far away. Are you all there? Yes. Okay. Now, now watch the wording. This is, this is how simple it is to become everything that I preached since I've been here. I'm going to give you the answer. Okay? If then you were raised with Christ. That word if is a little Greek word. It's not a challenge. He's not saying if you were raised with Christ. Prove it. The little Greek word if means since. So you know that to be true, right? Yes. Okay. So I'm right on that, right? Did my homework, didn't I? 
Since then, you were raised with Christ. Seek those things which are above. Now listen to this admonition. This is important. This is incredible. Because you're in the world, not... You're supposed to seek ye first the... Uh, in Matthew 6, that's actually the antidote for worry. Yeah. And he says, people that don't know God live in worry. Yeah. And he says, they worry about their well-being and what they need to live. He said, isn't, this Matthew 6, he said, isn't life more than these? Yes. In other words, isn't there a higher reason to life than survival? Yeah. Yes. It's a question he's asking. You know what Paul said? Paul said that I might lay a hold of that which he laid a hold of me for. Which means Paul realizes Jesus has intention in obtaining him. Yes. And he wants to walk out his intention. Yes. Yeah? Yes. You know what Philippians says too? It's God who works in you both to will and do for his good pleasure. Oh my goodness. You know what 1 Peter 2 says? That when you do good and suffer for it and take it patiently, it's commendable before God. Why? Because you have Christ. For to this you were called because you have Christ who set the example and you should follow his footsteps. What's it say? You're in the world and you're actually called to suffer for doing good. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why? Because it's the same way Christ was. Amen. And we should follow his footsteps. Yes. We shouldn't be thrown by it. We shouldn't be hard by it. We shouldn't let our good be conditional on the response of the one we good do good to. Because love doesn't fail or seek its own. Right? So we say, well, if they ain't going to treat me right, then I ain't going to do this no more. Well, I'm doing this trying to bless them. They want to be smart now. And all of a sudden you stereotype them and your heart becomes hard because they're lost. See how twisted it is? So he says you should follow his footsteps. Why? Because it's all about Jesus. He's the living epistle. So here, let's go back to this. So, set, uh, if you've been raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Now, he, he strengthens it and amplifies it in verse 2. So he's kind of repeating himself because it's important. Watch. Because your mind wants to go other places. Who knows that's true? Mm -hmm. Set your mind... Set your mind on things above, not the things of the earth. Here's why you do that. Verse 3, and this is what we haven't taught well. We've taught it in theory, but we haven't really taught it well as teachers in the church at large. I know growing up, yes. nobody taught this to me. They all taught me, I was praying a prayer to go to heaven, that if I die tonight and don't know where I'm going, I have to pray this prayer. That's the main punchline yes. for the altar call in America. Yes. And it has nothing to do with me dying. That's why water baptism has almost slipped out of the church at large. It's an annual event at best. Maybe biannual if you're lucky. There's not one place in the, in the New Testament book of Acts where men didn't get saved and baptism wasn't preached in the message. And when they got saved, it was that day immediately. Why? Because the baptism was in the message. Because it was all about dying to live. Mm. And the baptism is death, burial, and resurrection. It represents the grave. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And you go and die in His likeness, so you raise in the newness of life. Mm. And because we preach going to heaven, when our baptism slips away, because we preach salvation, not transformation. Mm. Are you with me? Yes. So watch this in verse 3. For you died. i got no good news for you. Yeah. <laughs> You done died. That's why I told you, we, when we baptize, we hold people to the bubble stop. You think I'm playing? We got faith for it, man. We just hold it there ain't no more bubbles for 40 seconds. When there's no more bubbles for 40 seconds, you got them. You bring them up and you trust God. And if they don't go, you know they're with Him. I just, I just preach that out of fun because there's a strong point that we need to die. To everything we've ever been. Yes. You don't bring that into the old, into the new life. That's called an old wine skin. Mm -hmm. So now the skin ain't gonna stay filled because the wine won't contain in that old mentality. Yes. See how it works? Yes. You died and your life. Guess where your life is now? Right. It's hidden with Christ in God. Now watch this. This is how intense this is. 
And when Christ, who is our life, Christ became our life, who is our life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. Okay, now here's where the answer is. Verse 5, therefore. Therefore means in light of what I just said. So don't just, if you're a Bible teacher, if you do little Bible studies and stuff, don't ever just jump into the therefore. Make sure you know what it's there for. Because when he says therefore, he means in light of what I just said. There's a lot of misconception, a lot of damage done when people just preach it, when they just preach a one line and make a whole doctrine out and don't read above and below and say what it's really saying. Some of these things we call cults. Little cult movements out there that we... If you look at their pamphlets and their stuff, they take five scriptures and put them together out of context. They'll take five scriptures and piece them to make them look like a paragraph of scripture, but they're from five different places to make a statement. Yes. And they're not the same culture of those top things. No, no, no. If you put each one in its respective place, it's not saying what they're using it to yeah. say. So it's deception, but it has a mesmerizing effect. Yeah. So when a sincere, God-fearing person reads it, they're like, oh my gosh. Because it sounds legit, because it's all pieced together. Absolutely. I mean, I know this is kind of a joke, but it would be like saying, Judas hanged himself, go and do their likewise. Yeah. <laughs> you can't piece scripture. Yeah. I like that word. Yeah. So, yeah, don't go and do their likewise. Well, Dan said, stop. <laughs> you don't want that suicide thing. You know what's so tragic about it? It's so tragic to me, it's, it's probably the biggest expression of deception that a man can get tricked into. Because he gets tricked into taking what's not even his. Come on. Whoa. And the argument is, what's well, my life, it was never your life. Exactly. It was always his life in you. So Satan wants you to be so self-centered that you say, what's my life, I'll do with it what I want. What's my body, that's why the argument over abortion is so frivolous. Because people say, what's my body? I should have my own rights. I should do it with my body. It was never your body. It was his body. That's right. Yes. We're his body. Yes. It's never yours. So suicide is a trick to get you to take what was never yours. That's right. Because it was always him in you. Yep. Yes. So Satan's trying to quench the possibility of him in you. And get you to write off your destiny, your legacy, your inheritance, your heritage. And then with a very sad zero story. And I'm not even one of those pastors and preachers that says everybody can be suicide in hell. Mm -hmm. I think God is understanding, merciful, and amazing. And I think the deceptions of the soul and sometimes I think we're gonna find out God is so merciful and realize at the same time, I'm not saying everybody that that, that, that has committed suicide isn't gonna face judgment of some sort. So don't don't say what I'm not saying and read into it too much. I just know some people are like, well, you take your life, you're done. You know, I, I, I had a guy that got overwhelmed and he didn't know how to get past and he, he was in unbelief, he, he was overwhelmed, he wasn't in faith and he kept musing on his situation, he didn't know how to get through it and he got afraid to face it and it was a cowardly thing and, and he shot himself. And he was somebody that I saw come to the Lord at work. It was somebody I personally baptized in a bathtub and gave a Bible to was somebody that was a chain smoker and he heard me talk about Jesus to another man and was eavesdropping. And when he went home, he woke up in the morning and realized he hadn't even thought of smoking a cigarette since that conversation. And he called my house freaking out. He said, I know it has to do with you. Because something was coming off of you when you were talking to mine. And I hadn't thought of smoking since then. So it was a tough one for me because he was doing so good for almost a year. And all of a sudden I got word that this thing hit and had to do with money and his wife and stuff. And he caught him off guard and he shot himself. And I was yeah, afraid to use. But does that mean he's just done and gone? I don't know. I feel like he was so overwhelmed and so deceived and he, yes. and he bought the lie. God's merciful and amazing. Yes. So I'm not condoning suicide. It's never a way of escape. It's a total deception. It's a terrible deception. Because it's a sign of cowardice, unbelief, self-centeredness, and, and sometimes willfulness. Some people are doing it to hurt their family. 
make somebody feel guilty for the rest of their life. There's all kinds of motives for suicide. But the bottom line is you get deceived to taking something that was never yours. It was never your life. It was always his life in you. From the beginning. So just a good side note on that. So when Christ who is a life appears, we're going to appear within the glory. Therefore. Therefore. Okay. Look at the language. Put to death. He didn't say moderate, find a healthy balance. He said kill life as you know it. In the flesh. Kill as you know it. That's really what he said. Look what he's talking about. Put to death your members which are on the earth. Put to death means kill it as if it never lived. Amen. So it never lives again. Yeah. Yes. If you'll notice every flesh list in your Bible, every flesh list, 2 Corinthians, Thessalonians, <coughs> Romans, Galatians, right here, every flesh list in your Bible, the very first thing listed is sexuality. In every situation, every instance of the list, every list, the first thing mentioned is sexuality. Why? Because it's the most exploited thing on the earth. There's, a, there's such a focus on sexuality because it's driven by sensuality. And it's fueled by emotions, loneliness, need to be loved, need to be accepted, need to feel valued. There's so many motives behind sexuality in the flesh, in the carnal life. And the number one thing mentioned on every list is sexuality. And there's not a topic that even comes close to a close second to the focus and exploitation of sexuality. There's not even a close second. Would you agree? Yes. So you don't counterfeit one dollar bills. You counterfeit things that have amazing value. So if the enemy took such time to counterfeit something at the extreme that you can't even do, you can't even do a food commercial, you can't even do an air conditioner commercial right. without the hair blowing in the fan and the skirt split. Uh, yeah. Oh. Like you can't even sell something that has nothing to do with a woman without the woman. Well, we don't want to know. But you know what I'm saying? There ain't a, there ain't nothing focused on more than that. On the earth, even close second. Because there's such a holy root, a holy value, and a holy purpose in that arena, and it's all fueled by, fueled by selflessness. And the sexuality we have all know is totally self centered. It has to do with what we get from it. Yeah. Watch. I'm just telling you, it's Bible. It's not my sermon. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication. That's any sexual activity outside of the covenant of marriage. Any sexual activity. Any form of sexual activity outside of the covenant of marriage is fornication. It's not just sexual intercourse. It's any sexual activity outside of the covenant. Watch. In first. Corinthians 7, excuse me for this, I know we haven't met, but he says it's not good for a man to touch a woman. I'm not sinning. When you look it up, it means with desire. Yeah. He's talking about people that aren't married and don't have covenant. You're not married yet, you're engaged. You shouldn't be spooning watching a video. <laughs> How do two people touch lips that believe they love each other that aren't married and not have desire? It's not good for a woman, for a man to touch. Would you just hold my hand, please? It's not good for a man to touch a woman. He's not talking about this. Right. He's talking about with desire. Amen. Are you with me? Yes. yes. I mean, if you look at the if you look at the marriage ceremonies we do, a lot of it comes from Jewish culture and, and ancient culture and stuff. The woman goes to the wedding, he, you know, the husband, he hasn't seen her on that day. She comes out, she's dressed, she's got a veil. It's usually your daddy that gives her away. I I I, I always thought I did the best way, you know, world. But I would give I would get all the living parents 
together and have meetings, make sure in-laws were never outlaws. All the step-parents, how can everybody, how can mom and dad to give the child away so the mom didn't covet the son while the dad was letting him go? Who gives this bride a marriage? I do. And the mom's over there going, I don't give her to that guy. <laughs> I get, I get a good loud, we do. <laughs> I'll just say it. But what happens up there at the front when the, when the daddy and the mom or the daddy walks her down, the music stops, and everybody's like, oh, she's beautiful. And the husband's standing there to be, and he's got tears in his eyes. He's like, man, this moment's happening. And what's the, what's the daddy do? What's he saying? She's been under my covering. And he hasn't had access to her because she's been mine. Mm -hmm. And today, I'm unveiling her and presenting her yes. to him. The pastor does the ceremony. They exchange vows. And he says this phrase we're all familiar with. You may now. Yes. Why does he say that? He's implying he hasn't ever kissed her before because she's dead under daddy and you can't kiss without desire. Hmm. 99.9% .9 of couples have slept together, Christian couples have slept together way before wedding day. Yeah. Yeah. Which says something. We're meeting needs, we have needs, and most of the time it's the guy pushing, and sometimes I've seen the girl wanting it to happen because she makes it feel like it feels like she's affirmed. I've just seen it work all these different ways. Put to death your members which are on the earth. Fornication, unclean is passion, evil desire and covetousness, which is all idolatry. You say, well, I feel like I love her, we're engaged, we're going to get married. It ain't evil, we want to be with her. You're not married, you're not in covenant. You haven't given yourself to her yet in vows and promise and words in the presence of God. Why are you kissing her? I wonder if you end up not marrying her. Now you're kissing somebody else's wife. Come on. <laughs> I'm just saying. But we got songs about kissing when you're 16. Mom's on the first date, the daughter's going, did you kiss him? Did you kiss him? And it's almost like it's a trophy. Yep. Guess what we're to do? Put all that to death. Mm -hmm. Why is sexuality the first thing on the list? Because it's driven by sensuality and self-centeredness across the board. Yeah. Yes. And I'm, I'm, I'm pained to say this, but I am convinced of it, that the words, I love you, have caused way more pain on the earth than it ever has blessing. Yes. Yes. Amen. Because it's been spoken in self-centered ways. Yes. Yes. Yep. The words, I love you, the most beautiful words a person can speak in sincerity, has caused way more pain than it ever has. Blessing. <laughs> so we ought to put something to death. Life as we knew it. Motives, sexual drive, desire, stuff. We get trained by life. I found a magazine an 11 year old should never be looking at on the railroad dock on a Sunday afternoon when it was closed, laying on the tracks, and I sat on the dock and read it and covered it up. That was my education that had triggered me at age 11. That was my breakthrough. You get it? Yes. And it aroused something in me that was already there. And it put understanding to something I didn't understand. And it made me want it, go after it, become like any other man. And scripture's telling me to kill it. How do I kill it? How do I put it off without getting into works and running the risk of failing? Good question, Pastor. I kill it by getting alone in prayer when nobody's looking and stepping out of that identity and recognizing that God never created me that way and that it ain't cool to be that way. Amen. And that every time I live that way, I'm actually living at the expense of someone. Well, let me just tell you something straight why I feel this way and I'm on this little topic. There's no one on the earth with a job description to scratch your itch or meet your need. Don't you reduce a person 
to meeting your need That's right. when you're on the earth to love. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. <laughs> you put it to death. You get alone with God. So here's what happened to me. I know there's children. I'll be a little sensitive. But I woke up the morning I was saved. And I was so aware of my twisted, perverse view of manhood. And my view of women. And I cried harder than you can comprehend. And I fell at my bedside. Holy <coughs> Spirit, give me this conviction. I'm saved for eight, seven, eight, ten hours. And I got this strong conviction. And I down on my knees, and here's what I said as a man. There is no way you made me this way. There's no way. Because it's at the expense of someone. And demand something from someone. I had that revelation already. And I said, you couldn't have made me this way. I don't know how to change it. I don't know how to fix it. And I don't know how to be different. But I trust you and you save me and I'm asking you make me what you made me to be. Yes. I was crying and I was never so serious. You know how many men don't want to give up their definition of manhood? I don't want that thing. When God walked me into what the truth is, I've been on both sides of the fence now. I've been on the carnal side and I promise you I've been on the spiritual side. And I'm like, what was I thinking? Oh. When God's presence, the hookah of God is over your bed, and you're more aware of His presence than you are how you're feeling and what's going on, and you're looking into your wife's eyes and all you feel is God and oneness and holiness, <laughs> and you don't even know you've reached that point because you're already beyond that point because of Him. Yes. <laughs> you may not feel the Lord. And I'm like, no wonder it's so exploited. Yeah, yeah. We're living for a sensual moment that needs relived and relived and relived instead of an exchange of holiness and purity and oneness and unity. <laughs> he brought me to the place where if my wife wanted me to just hold her and pray over her through the night. That's all I would do. And I was so okay. I was so afraid of that arena for a season because I was so messed up in it that I didn't even want to open the door. Now that ain't, that ain't really healthy, right? But God understands. I would rather just do without than risk violating something because my heart was changed. So in that place, Holy Spirit said, I'll take your hand and walk you through Without saying that, I didn't even know he was doing it. He just did it. Then he went to the place where it was never about me. It wasn't about how I feel. It wasn't about what I need. It wasn't like, hey, it's three days, you know, honey. Yeah, we've been kind of busy. Yeah, you, know. <laughs> hey, you know. You know I'm off tomorrow, right? It wasn't nothing like it. wasn't me being on my best behavior and cleaning up the dishes because I'm home. Oh, I've done all that and worse. No, it was just, I love you. I spend more time in prayer with her and worship. Spirit of God would come over her. I'd lay hands on her and speak over her. And she'd fall out in the Spirit of God and be laying on the carpet for a half hour. Mm -hmm. Under the presence of God. And I'm just standing there worshiping God all over me in the room. And I look at her and she just looks beautiful in the presence of God. I'm like, God, you just changed us. I said, she says, honey, you carry me? I'm like, what? You carry me upstairs? Look in my eyes and talk to me. And tell me who I am. I feel like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, we were selling cheap for a moment. We, we're reading Christian books. If we can achieve together, we're at the highest peak. <laughs> like our Christian goal is to achieve together. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> I've never read a Christian book on sexuality that's even close to the truth. It's just the world, what the world's doing with Christian language out there. Mary read one that's close. 
You say, well, why don't you write one? <laughs> you never say write one. Put to death. So watch. You say, well, if you just share all that with it, you get home with what I just told you. If you're married in this room, if you're a guy, get along with God. Lord, I don't want any dysfunction. I don't want, I want, I want to be driven. I don't want nothing to own me but you. I don't want to look at my wife and lust her. I want to love her. When you don't want a man to lust, you stop. You don't want a man to need you or want you. You're called for a man to love you. Amen. Yes. With his life. Yes. Yeah? Yes. And cherish you and nurture you. Mm -hmm. I wonder if something happens and you can't even come together and we don't have this revelation. And spouses get insecure and say, well, you ain't getting it with me. He's going to try to get it somewhere. Come on. Come on, I'm just being real. It's like a soap opera in the church. Yeah. I've pastored for years. I've counseled. I've had spouses walk out with spouses. The other spouse, three days in, is asking me to if it's okay if they date. I'm like, you didn't even stand to stand for your spouse. Well, they cheated. I have the legal right to leave. Mm. Okay, so if you cheat on God, he's just going to leave? Obviously not. <laughs> I'm just telling you, this stuff's out there more than we want to face. And when somebody splits up, there's a significant other in their life in no time. In no time. And it's amazing how fast it happens. And it reveals we need someone. And what we need is to become someone. That's right. Yes. You know what gave my wife great confidence when this all happened to me? She came to me some while in because she realized and recognized in time that I was a totally different man than those first 13 years. And she came to me and she said this guy, and she said, Honey, I just realized something. If something happened to me and I could never physically come together with you again, it wouldn't even phase you because you love me and don't need me. Mm -hmm. And I looked at her and I said, You got it, bro. I'm honored to be your husband. That's called freedom. Yes. Not itchy. Itchy. <laughs> if you get itchy, somebody's going to start scratching the itch. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't itchy. This is what I did. I put to death. That's right. In prayer. Mm -hmm. Sincere. God heard my sincere heart cry, and guess what Grace did? Yeah. Washed over me and said, okay. And he changed me. Yes. And all of a sudden I had the ability to be different with my wife because I wanted to. Not everybody wants to. Come on. I shared this revelation with two pastors early on in my life, and they put their hands over theirs and said, stop. Just stop. Stop. I don't want to hear it. I enjoy my sex life. Stop. And I said, wow, well, you'll stay limited. They didn't even want to think spiritual. They just enjoyed me. Hey, everything's great between us. I dig her, she digs me. Put to death these things on the earth. He's talking about self-centered motives, people. Yep. Covetous. It's all idolatry. Living for you is idolatry. It's, unless the seed dies and falls to the ground, it divides alone. It's single. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, which means those who continue to disobey and live this way. Now look how humble he, he is with this and keeps us humble. In which you yourselves once walked when you lived this way. So he's expecting that there's an absolute distinction with the way we lived and the way we're living. The thing that drove us and that don't drive us anymore. Why? We put it to death. We're not managing it. Yes. Yeah. We killed it yes. through understanding, through prayer, through yes. sanctification. We got alone in a room and we submitted ourselves. We knelt, we cried, whatever that sincerity looks like. And we put off and we put on. And grace met us there. You get it? Yes. Yes. I've been in college dorms. I've been invited into college dorms preach this stuff to college men. Mm -hmm. I was in Dallas Baptist University in the dorms for three days. Somehow I got in there. <laughs> <laughs> and they just kept surrounding me with students. Now I talked about sexuality. 
and what God intended. I talked about how the woman was created. I talked about her parts and how God did it and made it. It's all intentional. And the three men in the room that were crying were the only three married. You know why they were crying? Because all they did was want their wife and had no clue how to love her. Come on. They married her because they wanted her. Because she was pretty. You women feel pressed to be pretty at a young age. And if you feel like you don't fit the gene pool, then you got to come up with some other option. And there's just pressure on women that just grates on my heart. Because the world says it's this, and it's not at all. Exactly. Amen. <clears throat> And the three men that cried were the three married guys. I loved it. They cried and cried. And we surrounded them. I said, what's going on with you? Why are you bringing it? Because I'm married and I haven't loved her. I've done this ever less my wife. I just lost her. I wanted to go sleep with her. I said, ah. God made me for more. You believe that? Yeah, he made me for more. <laughs> Tell me that again. He made me for more. <laughs> what's happening when he's doing that? <laughs> the grace is coming. So let's just pray right now. See how it works? Yes. In which you yourselves once walked when you lived that way. But now you, who? You. you. It's not an altar call. It's not a spirit. You don't need deliverance. Mm -hmm. You yourselves are to put off these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. There's another list. He's not giving us a list so he subjects us to fail. He's showing us who we aren't so we can step into who we are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's telling us to put it off. You yourselves are to put off these things. Sure. Anger is the first one on the list. Watch. The world's answer for anger is management. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anger management classes. Yes. <laughs> That's the best they can afford. When you throw tantrums, they put you in an anger management class to teach you how to control your anger, and that's maturity. In the church, it's hypocrisy. Mm. It's me being angry at Craig, but I don't show that because I'm too spiritual to show that, but I feel that, and I see that, and we walk by him, and I say hi, and we look like buddies, but I have disdain towards him. And I'm just mature and spiritual because I'm managing that. <laughs> it's called hypocrisy. Oh, he didn't say manage your anger towards your He said put it on. Amen. No, I'm picking you because I couldn't be angry at you anyway. <laughs> 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 just too nice. And man, did you sing that song tonight, buddy? Woo. Who heard him sing that song? Yes. You already know it, but he belted that thing out. Yes. I was like, what? You go, boy? <laughs> First time I heard you cut loose, like you cut loose tonight. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I put it off. I don't manage it. How do you put it off? You get along with prayer and prayer. Why? Watch. You recognize it was never made for me. Anger works through the platform of self-centeredness. Yep. Every sin ever committed comes through the wellspring of self-centeredness. Yep. So if I deny myself and doubt myself, then this thing has no place to function. Mm -hmm. So I get along with God. Father, you never made me to be angry. Don't be afraid to pray this stuff. Watch. I thank you that anger will no more subdue my life, control my life, or rule my life. I do not wake up for what people can do for me, not even my spouse. God, I wake up to shine. Mm -hmm. Father, I thank you for yes. putting new life in me, a new and living way in me. And I renounce anger and put it off and say I do never again have the right, no matter what the facts, to be an angry man because I'm a man of love. Because yes. I'm a man of God. I've prayed that stuff. I've walked my bedroom so many times. My life has changed forever. God, I'll never be the same. Stress and strife will never subdue me. Just the motives of the flesh, the carnal life, will never have power. You have made me a man of the Spirit. I'm praying that when you ain't looking. <laughs> and then when you see, guess what you get? When I partake of life, guess what my manifestation is? Everything I'm believing. See how it works? So I'm being saved by grace through faith. I'm putting it off and putting something else on. Let me show you how it works. 
You're not going to lie to one another. Why? Because you put off. You put off. It's a place of prayer. Who would say in fairness that you've, some of you recognize that in your life you have something that could change? There's a weakness. There's something you'd love to see sharpened or removed in your life. Okay. So you take that to prayer. Recognize it for what it is. Call it out in prayer and, and acknowledge in your heart. It's for you. God knows everything about your heart. It's for you. You acknowledge, I never want to live that way. It's not how you created me. What you're doing is you're, you're separating ties and permission and just natural, like, well, everybody's this way at times. We all have our moments, brother. No, you're shattering that. You're saying, I don't ever want that moment. This is never God. It never produces fruit. It's not life. And He didn't create me this way. But you make it personal. You didn't create me this way. I don't want this in my life. Father, I see myself having a tendency sometimes to this and this and this. But that is not who I am in you. That is not who you are in me. And I renounce that and I put that off. And I thank you, God. And then you flip it and you begin to proclaim the answers over your life. And watch. It's important you're not just doing prayer stuff. Mm. That you actually sincerely don't ever want to be that. Come on, man. And you don't have the power to not be that in your own strength. And he steps in and empowers you to not be that. I have never tried to be a Christian. I know that sounds strange. But I hope you don't. I never tried to. I just accepted I'm his. And my life responds to the belief that he's in me. I've never tried to be a Christian. I never tried to stop sinning. I never tried to stop doing the flesh things that I used to do. It just changed. Because I was with Him. Amen. Does that make sense? Yes. Hmm. So you're not going to lie to one another. Why? You put off the old man and his deeds. And look what you've done in verse 10. See, you can go to church your whole life and nobody's going to teach you. They say, just teach you a prayer, prayer to go to heaven and make sure you stay faithful in the church and give your tithe, by the way. Come on. <laughs> but who's telling us now that we put off this old man, we're going to put on the new man? That there's a putting off and a putting on. Yeah. Who's the new man? We're going to put on who? Jesus. The new man. Who is the new man? Jesus. He's renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Do you see that the whole gospel is a restoration back to the image of God? Yes. yes. And that everything outside of that that's not His image, we recognize and humbly put off and sincerely put off in prayer. Put off. It's not works. It's faith. You put it off and you put on the new man who's renewed in knowledge according to Him. Yep. Yes. So now watch how gracious He is in verse 12. In verse 12, he's, he's going to show you, since he broke down the image of the flesh, who knows he did a good job of breaking down the image of the flesh. Yes. Now he's going to break down the image of the new man, of him. Of him, the Lord, H-I-M, capital. Watch. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, here's how you know he's doing that. Put on. The fact that he's using the same term, put on, Put on the new man who's renewed in knowledge according to the image. So now he's saying, okay, let me break down the image with adjectives. And I want you to put him on. Let's look at the image. Would you all say this is the image of the one that made us? Tender mercies. Yes. Kindness. Yes. Humility. Yes. Meekness. Yes. Long-suffering or patience. Yes. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. Yes. And if anyone has a complaint against one another, file it with Gerald and hope he responds. <laughs> if anyone has a complaint against one another, even as Christ already forgave you, so go ahead and forgive. Amen. And above all these things, put on love. Why? It's the bond of perfection. What a scripture. So guess what you do? When you have these little things you raised your hand about, you take it to prayer. Not prayer line. Prayer. Amen. Amen. Intimacy, communion, 
out of your heart acknowledge it was never how God intended you to be, created you to be, it doesn't produce life and you don't want it in your life. And I feel like I've been trained by it, I've been prone to react that way, I don't want to, I don't want to live that way. You didn't make me this way, I became this way, living in the earth, and I want transformation and change. God, I thank you that I'm a person full of tender mercies. I thank you, God. I don't need to pray for patience. Love is patient. Love is kind. You're just making me more and more like you. And now you're having this communion. Sometimes, sometimes, when I was in prayer like this, I would kneel and I would say, Father, I just give myself and I thank you that never again. And I would put off things that I knew I didn't want anywhere near my life, right? And then I'd begin to stand up and Father, I just thank you. And I'd put on in prayer. I'm not praying a list of wants and needs and praying for all this stuff I need him to do for me. I want to be more like him. Mm -hmm. yeah. it's, it's the most important prayer of our life is this putting off, putting on, and believing the transformation and change the Holy Spirit brings by grace working through faith. Yes. They're not self-made. Now watch what happens. You get thrown into situations where you usually responded this way and now you respond in his way. Guess what happens? You catch yourself doing it and realize you ain't trying it. And all of a sudden you realize that before you'd have been this, before you'd have said this, before you'd already caught yourself with this. And all of a sudden that wasn't even in the picture. And you told me, and then guess what you do? You get captured by it and you start realizing it's him. And you start realizing you ain't self-made. You start realizing you are what you are by the grace of God. And guess who all the glory goes to? Yeah. So you don't get a Christian trophy for being some disciplined disciple. He gets all the glory for being faithful to his word. Yes. And all of a sudden, guess what you do? You love him more. Yeah. You trust him more. Yeah. And you're believing more. Yeah. And you're letting this thing happen. Yeah. You get it? Yeah. Guys, this is the only reason after 28 years I could be as fanatical as I am. Yes. <laughs> I'm excited. Yes. This is real. Yes. It's not old. It's not a precept. Come on. It's what we're created for and what you pay yeah. for. Yes. And it's a really big deal. Do you know how big of a deal it is to be in your marriage and be with your wife and know the way you used to be and know that it ain't nothing like that anymore? Do you know what that does when you look in the mirror? That's why you can walk by that full length mirror and say, Are you kidding me? <laughs> You walk up and look yourself right in the eyes. Man, I can see. You receive from the love of God. I see His love in your eyes and countless. Man, I don't even know what you're doing standing here. The world out there needs what I see in you. Yeah. Dude, you're going to have a crazy good day. <laughs> <laughs> and then you walk out. You think I'm going to walk out and then get caught up with a he said, she said, well, I feel, well, how come they, well, they should have never. <laughs> <laughs> Not today, friend. Today ain't the right day. Tomorrow's not going to work either. <laughs> Are you all with me? Yes. yes. Who sees us as how we can change? Yes. yes. Amen? Amen. 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 Would you agree, church, that God has forgiven us of everything we've done? Yes. yes. Do you actually agree with Scripture that He's made us clean, that He's forgiven us, and He remembers our lawless deeds no more? Yes. yes. Okay. So I'm tricking you a little bit. So if you believe that, then you never, ever, ever again have permission to live in guilt, condemnation, or shame. You can't possibly live it. You have to live in rejoicing and thanks. You can't live in insecurity. You can't ever again be self-conscious. You can't ever, ever again believe you're unworthy. You can't feel bad about yourself. You have to feel amazing about yourself because God saw fit to see your day born. There's a time to be born. And here you sit. And you were predestined before the foundation of the world to be adopted as a son or daughter. You're telling me that life's an accident? No. No. Wow. no you're not here because dad went in your mom. 500 million sperm cells race to one destination and you can only have one winner and you said you never won nothing. <laughs> you won the greatest race of your life. And you didn't even have to swim hard. Biology says when the gun shoots, boom, they all swim and they all mark spits and right up to the edge. Yeah. No, you can take your time and back you, know. <laughs> you can sip your little iced tea, but you the one. You was predestined before the, there's a time to be born and it's your day. 
You're out of the gate, baby. You're headed. You get up there, they're all trying to get in the egg. They surround them. I'm going to say, you can't even see the egg. You got 500, you got 499, 99, 99, all around that egg. You go up there, they split like the Red Sea, and you just right inside. They all out there, how did he do that? Because it was me before the foundation of the world. Yes. Yes. It was the time to be born, and now is my time. Amen. My life is the will of him. Yes. Woo! Yes! Yes! You did it? Yes. yes! So you never again, when you say you're a believer, have the permission to feel insecure and unworthy right. and unloved. Amen. See? So I guess this boils down to what do we really believe? Thoughts, impressions, feelings, or the Word of God? Yeah. Memories, history, past, or the Word of God? Word of God. Yes. So tonight I'm calling you for the rest of your days to be believers. Because if we stand before God and we're guilty of believing, then everything else is in Amen. I want one verdict when I stand before the king. And I know everybody says, well, they're under the king. I want one verdict when I stand before the king. Yeah, Muller, you believed. Yes. Because yes. if I get that, I got well done. <laughs>
I said, I'm so glad I got to you this weekend. And I said, and I'm so glad you feel it better. I've been praying for you. It makes my heart so happy. She made a sweet smile. Did you see where she was sitting tonight? Yeah. 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 That's not an accident. Yeah. No. no. It's just children respond to that stuff. Yes. Yeah. No? And it was just that little extra, just that you don't acknowledge the value in it. It was more because we're all praying, but it was just that little extra special. You are that important. Yes. And she's perceiving she's right there because she knows I sit there. She's right there eating the stuff, sitting there eating chips before the service. I can go up and I'm like, oh, oh. She's for you. Isn't that sweet? Yeah. You love people. Let's, let's do it quick. Can we pray for the sick? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Okay, listen, let's pray for the sick. The reason we pray for the sick. The main reason is because of redemption. It's the forgiveness of sins. Yes. He forgave our sins. If He forgives our sins, He heals our disease. He marries the two over and over in Scripture. Yes. Over and over, He marries forgiveness and healing. Yes. The paralytic, they lowered Him through the roof. What did Jesus say to the paralytic when they lowered Him through the roof? He said, take heart, son. What did He say? Yes. Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Well, you know they didn't tear off the roof and lower him down to hear that. <laughs> they know everybody he's touching is getting healed, and they, everybody can't walk, and they tore a roof off so he could walk. Right. And Jesus don't just say, take your bed and walk and do what they're asking. He says, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. Because he's teaching. Yeah. And when he said it, you know what happened in their minds? Boom! They just went off. And he said, why are you guys always thinking evil? In your mind. He says, what's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or rise in what? But to show you. Yeah. The Son of Man has the power to forgive sin. Get out of the wall. Yeah. What was he connecting it to? The forgiveness of sin. Mercy triumphing over judgment. Yeah. God sending Jesus as an ambassador. Pleading, being reconciled with God. Not imputing their trespasses. It's always him. Watch 1 Peter 2. He bore your sin and my sin where? In his body on a tree. Yes. Why? That we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness and by his stripes. Yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. Talk about forgiveness. Yeah. Yes. Let me tell you how serious God is about this. Some people don't understand this in Isaiah 53. It most people see God crying when Jesus is getting crucified. That's how they picture God. Broken and crying because it's his son. Better read your Bible. That's right. And he's not a sadistic parent. No, please. Yeah. It pleased yeah. the father to bruise his son and cause his soul to grief when he made him an offering for sin. Why? Because he saw the fruit of it in our lives redeemed. That's what scripture reveals. It pleased him. Why? Because he knew on the third day he would raise him up through the spirit of holiness and crush the power of death, hell, and the grave and take the keys yes. and have authority, name above every name. Yes! It pleased him. It's amazing. We see him crying on that day. We picture him being sad. Totally restoring. He's, he's giving one son knowing he's going to raise him from the dead and crush the power of death and obtain many sons. Yes. Yes. And Jesus, for that joy, said before him, said, bring it on. <laughs> nobody taking my life. I'm all in. Yep. You know how the thieves, when they probably nailed him to the cross, they're screaming, pulling back their arms, they're already beaten, they're about ready to get, you get one spike in your hand, I can't imagine, the cross had to be brutal. They had a hammer and a spike through your hands, and now they're getting your other hand and forcibly, and you're wincing and tensing. There wasn't an ounce of that with Jesus. So it couldn't have been, because it could never be said they took his life. That's right. They get over to Jesus, he's already laying there. Yeah. No, he's laying there. He's extending his hands, cooperating. Even though it's going to hurt. And even though it ain't fun, he's despising the shame. Yes. Because there's a joy yes. that he sees. Yes. And it's you and me, forgiven, redeemed, and restored back to the Father. 
Yes. Let's not turn this into a carrot for heaven when I die. Mm. When it's heaven when I live. Yes. yes. Are you with me? Yes. Now I'm not upset about heaven when I die. That's amazing. <laughs> but the goal is knowing him and manifesting him. So why do we pray for the sick? Because we believe the blood of Jesus, the cross of Jesus. The blood of Jesus speaks better things and brings a mercy that trumps over judgment. And man gets sick sometimes just because he's in the world, just because stuff. It's, 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 we're subject to things sometimes. Now I believe we can grow in covenant. I'm gonna teach about it a lot because people get condemned to compare themselves and they can get weird, but I do believe there's a place where you can live without fear. I believe there's a place where you can live in covenant. And people call things like divine health and things like that. I don't have those theologies. I'm not pursuing divine health. I just pursue to never live afraid. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. And because I never live afraid, it's amazing how I'm abstained from... I've never had a flu shot in my whole Christian life. And I've never had close to the flu. I don't get head colds. I don't get nothing. But I'm not expecting to. It's not flu season to me. Come on. Yes. 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 It's not the common cold. I live in a different kingdom. Amen. And I'm not being arrogant. Nope. No, that's the truth. I'm not afraid of what I eat. I thank God and I eat. I just watch myself and temperance is my rule. Nothing's going to hurt me. Why do you put in Mark any deadly thing? If you eat any deadly thing, it won't harm you. And we're so afraid to even eat. We got so much natural knowledge, we can't even eat. Yep. I'm, not, I'm not afraid. No. <laughs> no, I'm just being serious. Knowledge will mess you up. You're reading so much stuff sometimes, and, and then you read the newest finding in the, the, 